Good morning to all of you. <coughs> Good morning, all of the participants. I welcome you all on the second day of national webinar series. Yesterday, we had a video message from Dr. J. R. Rao and due to and two lectures, one of Dr. L. D. Singla on integrated parasite control as a mean to boost animal health and productivity in Indian perspective. And the second lecture of Dr. M. L. Gutney on epidemiology of canine vector borne parasite parasitic diseases in India with reference to clinical management. Both the lectures were very, very good, excellent. And we have tried our best that it should reach to you <coughs> to its best quality. We had a video of Dr. J. R. Rao, but due to low voice quality, uh, the message was not audible to all of you. So we have pasted him in the Indian Association of uh, Indian Association uh, Indian Association of Anti-Pesetology WhatsApp as well as in the Indian Pesetology. So all of you are requested to please view the message, video message in these groups. For today, we have two lectures, one of Dr. Shri Kumar, Professor and Head, Department of Wildlife, Mumbai Veterinary College, Chennai, on parasites of wildlife and their management. Dr. Shri Kumar, he is the Professor and Head, Department of Wildlife, Madras Veterinary College, Chennai. The second lecture is of Dr. Sanjay Kumar, Principal Scientist, National Research Center on Equines, Hisar. He, is, he will be speaking on equine pyroblastosis, epidemiology, vector ecology, risk factor, diagnosis and control. In addition to this, we have one video message of our stalwart on histosomiasis, Dr. M. C. Agrawal. He will be giving his, uh, he has devoted his entire life on animal. Uh, Dr. M. C. Agrawal, a scientist who does need to the first parasitologist in India who have a national fellow project. It is an honor and I'm happy that I'm a student of Dr. M. C. Agrawal also. As such, if you look for his biodata, more than seven research projects he has completed during his entire life. He has written four books on various, various parasitic diseases. One of them, one or two of them are of parasitology. Still now, he is working on another book on amphistomosis. In addition, he has published more than 150 research pub uh, uh, publications. He has written many reviews, many of the other articles, and even during his life cycle, he, has, he happened to visit the European countries in relation to animal cystosomiasis to discuss the same with human cystosomiasis, which is a very big problem in the African countries. We, for, we have the video message of Dr. M.C. Akarwal, so uh, I request our technical experts to please play the video message of Dr. Hitzel. I 
Thank you for your uh, informative and inspiring lecture. Uh, for me, uh, as uh, Dr. M. C. Agarwal told, that he retired in 2005. But for me or for the persons who are in contact with uh, Agarwal sir, sir is always young. He always thinks of ideas. He always thinks for solutions. He always thinks for the problems which are actually affecting the animals. Really. So thank you for the. Uh, Dr. M. C. Agarwal for this important lecture. In addition, I will request all the participants to please visit their blogs. One of them is Indian Parasitologist and second is Indian Cystosomiasis. So you can visit these blogs or in detail you can go to their books also or to their articles. All they are very much focused, very much they are uh, Beneficial for the farmers and for the cure of the. Now I request Vishwakarman Maharana to take for the present. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
colleagues and juniors. A very pleasant morning to the vast galaxy of intellectuals gathered on this online platform. We feel privileged and honored to Dr. Sri Kumar, sir, our next speaker. Dr. Sri Kumar completed his BBSc from Madras Veterinary College in 1989. He got his Master's in Parasitology in 1989. After brief stint with the State Animal Husband Department as a veterinary assistant surgeon, he joined Tanuvas as an assistant professor in 1992. He obtained his doctorate degree in veterinary parasitology from IVRI in 2001. His thesis was awarded the most prestigious Jawaharlal Nehru Award for the best PhD thesis by Indian Council of Agriculture Research. He served as a visiting scientist in the laboratory of renowned parasitologist Dr. J.P. Dube at the Animal Parasitology Unit of USDA Maryland from 2001 to 2004 and worked on api complexes after which he continued to work for Tanvas. He specializes in molecular parasitology with emphasis on its application towards diagnosis and genotyping of parasitic disease. He has published more than 94 research papers out of which 54 journals with impact factor more than one. He has a cumulative impact factor of around 103 and an average impact factor of around 1.25. He has an age index of 26. His research paper and publication can be assessed through popular Google Scholar as well as research aid. He is a self-taught herpetologist and specializes in the conservation of venomous snakes. He has active interest in wildlife rehabilitation and was a member of the Emergency Relief Network of Wildlife Trust of India. He has been involved in wildlife rescue and necropsy during his stint in the sea breeding research station, Milgiri. He had published papers on specific diseases and secondary oh, poisoning of large so pellets. He has been instrumental in uploading yeah. educational contents onto the online the network portals mm -hmm. to facilitate mm -hmm. students who understand the practical nuance of veterinary parasitological problems in the field as well as wildlife disease mm -hmm. management. The database can be accessed online. The student can access photos and videos from the online portals and also participate in the digital investigations. He is an avid birder and contributes documentations to the most famous worldwide online portals like eBird and GenoCutting. Presently, he is the professor and head of the Department of Wildlife Sciences at Madras Veterinary College and is involved in undergraduate students and postgraduate and doctoral scholars in wildlife health management. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Maharana, for the glowing introduction. Um, uh, th thanks, everybody. A very good uh, morning to all who are uh, gathered here for the webinar. Uh, when I was uh, uh, called in to give this lecture, usually because because of these days I ride two horses. Uh, I'm basically a pathologist, and uh, for the past few years I've been donning the role of a wildlife veterinarian too. So uh, I thought it would be better to merge both these passions into one and uh, give a talk on the parasites on wildlife management, wildlife and their management. Essentially, the uh, array of speakers that uh, this particular webinar had in invited uh, was what uh, made me very confident about uh, giving this talk because this is less of parasitology and a little more of wildlife. But you know, there are the doyens in the field who are uh, who have spoken before me. We had some excellent lectures yesterday for, from uh, Dr. Doctors um, Singla and uh, Gartner Saab, which were very exhaustive. And we have some more coming down the line. And I know that uh, these speakers are the best in their fields and uh, they will be meticulous in covering their fields of interest uh, so that the uh, audience can have a lot of information about parasites per se. I thank uh, Dr. Uh, D.P. Sharma. Dr. Sir, why is got mute? Mute. Uh, okay. Is it coming now? Hello? Hello? Yes, sir. You're audible now, sir. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't know. Some, some technical hit. Okay. Uh, I, I uh, profusely thank Dr. D.P. Sharma, the Dean, uh, Dr. S.K. Gupta, uh, for having me here. Uh, 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 Dr. Sudeep Vora, who is the Organizing Secretary. Of course, uh, Maharana, who was uh, the first up to call me, and the young uh, parasitologist Nehil Anil and Aman, 
for thinking of my name amidst the galaxy of uh, stars that you have brought in for this uh, lecture. Uh, so the talk is on parasites of wildlife and their uh, management. So as I say, any lecture about uh, parasitology, whether it's after lunch or early in the morning, this is the kind of uh, stimulus it evokes from most people. You know, this guy is actually very interesting. I'd like to talk to him a lot more. He's on the bench while the others are sleeping. Uh, but uh, uh, being at 10 o'clock in the morning, I know uh, many people are in the uh, privacy of their homes and uh, sit tight in your chairs, uh, don't fall over during the lecture. Um, because we have around uh, 132 slides, not really, we have only 32 slides where I'm going to talk about parasitology uh, and wildlife. <clears throat> So essentially, when uh, I was called in to talk about parasitology, uh, parasites of wildlife, I didn't want to uh, take it as a lecture where I list out the different parasites that uh, cause disease in wildlife and the treatment. Because you know that whether it's a wildlife or a domestic animal, parasitology is the same. You know, the, the clinical signs are the same. The way you go get to diagnose it, it uh, it's the same thing. And then the treatment is also the same. You don't do anything different. Only thing is most of the treatment that you have tried out for domestic animals have not been tried out for wildlife, but then you have no other goal, you have to just try it out. So what is different or is there anything at all different when it comes to parasitology in wildlife is what I was trying to look at. And during my past uh, uh, years as a wildlife rescuer, I have had so many experiences with uh, necropsies uh, for uh, routine deaths and uh, man, human uh, involved deaths where I found a lot of parasites and you know the parasite that changed my outlook about parasitology in wildlife parasites in wildlife and my talk would be on basically two uh, different uh, fields one about the free ranging uh, wildlife that is there in the wild about which you don't know anything except when you um, contact it for the necropsy and uh, some about the wildlife that are captive bred that are in the zoos where you have a record of what is the uh, quality of health what is the treatment uh, given and such things so uh, my talk would be split into the free ranging wildlife as well as the uh, captive wildlife in the zoos and how diseases or how parasites can coexist with them and how a tipping of the balance can cause uh, disease to show itself leading to death so before we launch on to the talk, we need to understand a few things. First is that the parasites are part of the life of a wild animal. Not just wild animal, the parasites are part of any animal. So you don't find any animal, any living form that is free of parasites. And uh, it's a very successful way of living. And uh, we have to make sure that the parasite is associated with it, it's not just the presence. Captive and free ranging, as I told you, the, the, they are two distinct states in wildlife. Uh, a captive animal and a free ranging animal, both are wild animals, but still there's a lot that changes, you know, uh, their environment, uh, the, the stalking strength, the other animals that live with them, and all these play a role in uh, parasite disease in the captive animal. So develop an understanding of the selected parasites. There are hundreds of parasites uh, present but only a few are of very great importance or grave importance in uh, wildlife. So we need to pick them out and understand what are those uh, few parasites that could be uh, important in causing death or disease in animals and have a better understanding of those particular parasites. Recognize the zoonosis potential. Um, it, this point can't be overemphasized at the, these days where we are all bound down due to COVID-19. You know, when there is a parasite, a wild animal that is dead and you are raring to go for a necropsy, the thought that should be at the back of your mind is that there could be some uh, zoonosis sitting there waiting for you. Um, you know, the forest has shrunken and most animals that have been in the uh, privacy of the jungles and now come to the borders, they could bring along with them lots of diseases, not just parasitic diseases, many other diseases that can actually afflict humans. So before you actually jump onto that necropsy and cut it up and see what is inside, you need to be aware that uh, there could be a, a very uh, fatal disease hiding in that animal and then be aware and uh, be prepared to protect yourself from that and protect the people who are around you with them. Actually, we are uh, grappling with the uh, deaths of uh, fruit bats right now in Madurai. They have been falling down dead and, uh, you know, uh, we are reluctant to send people to even collect them actually, bring it over to college to have a look. 
so we need to be aware that uh, parasites are, uh, they could be related or associated with zoonosis which can have far reaching effects in humans so with this uh, we remember that parasites do not aim to kill the animal never you know i always really ask this question uh, to the audience when it, it, it's it's a talk who is the person who is sitting there and thinking that uh, you should be healthy wealthy and have a good night night sleep and most people don't uh, get to answer it right it is the thief right because a parasite has no uh, evolution advantage in killing yes, except when they are the immature stages that are staying waiting to get into uh, the final host most parasites they want to stay with you they want to live with you they want to share your environment and then propagate themselves so there should be something that actually predisposed the parasite and made it uh, kill the animal that's a factor that we need to look into so parasites are part of uh, life and then uh, they don't usually aim to kill and mere presence cannot be construed as disease and this is one mistake that even uh, the parasites uh, veterinary parasitologists do all the time uh, they do an necropsy they find bunches of uh, parasitomes and uh, put all the blame on them and say that this is what killed them the parasitomes in rumen they are just travelers with the animal they don't do anything and if they had the power to litigate they can actually sue you for defamation so we need to know whether they are the cause of death or just present and you do uh, dual harm by blaming a parasite that is not at all involved and then uh, missing the real cause of death which might kill more animals association with disease is only based on incriminating evidence this is where a role of a veterinary parasitologist actually comes into play incriminating evidence picking out whether the lesion caused substantiates the death be not just the mere presence there should either be numbers which are uh, over and above the limit that is prescribed for an animal or lesions even caused by a single parasite that can be clearly associated without any sort of uh, doubt or unequivocally associated with the parasite so here we need to work a lot on finding out that particular solid incriminating evidence before we actually blame <coughs> a parasite for causing a disease some i have already dwelled uh, dwelled on this particular point some not uh, of course many parasites are public health important and when we deal with the disease in the animal we have to be aware of the other side also and warn people because the people usually who associate, who associate with you the forest guard worker they don't have the preliminary idea or basic idea of what can cause them harm or not so it is up to you to warn them and keep them safe also right so uh, what is the status of parasites in the wild for example if you go into the serengeti you have uh, loose wildebeest and uh, all of the herbivores and carnivores running around do we have parasites in them or on them so there have been a lot of studies done on that particular part and uh, the results have been quite surprising you know uh, this particular study in uh, kruger healthy zebra they were uh, not just zebra this study had a, a, a wide range of uh, healthy animals that were trapped and looked in for the number of parasites and about 300 million individual parasites of 14 genera were picked out from the host you know in the wild the premium or uh, the stress is not just on uh, being fit but also showing yourself as fit you know there are wild animals that are looking to pick out the weak from the flock so an animal to survive has to be fit and has to show itself to be fit so parasite despite being a large number of parasites present and the load being high most wild animals do not show any clinical sign of the disease it is just they're sitting with them and living with them and all this uh, this study was on healthy animals not those that were stragglers and uh, we they found out that all these animals had loads of parasites in them living with them peacefully so no clinical signs of the disease so all these animals were then potentially living in an, a status where any stress it could be environmental and medical a complicated uh, associated disease nutritional stresses or any other disease this parasitic disease might actually show up and cause impediment to the animal so we need to bear this in mind so when we do an necropsy whether that's a cause or that is just a bystander similarly babesias lots of babesias <coughs> excuse me uh, three babesia species were det detected in um, uh, lions and other animals 
<clears throat> Debisha is actually a widening, a growing field, and I have a speaker after me who is well versed in it, and I know that he'll be touching, touching up all the points in Debisha's. But this uh, map literally shows. Uh, this was done in 2016. The Debisha uh, situation all around the world, actually. Uh, it, these uh, remind, uh, please remember these were uh, from animals that were trapped, healthy animals that were trapped, and uh, blood taken in uh, for uh, DNA studies. And uh, this is the situation all over the world. About eight, 16 species of Babesia and other uh, hemoprotists or pyroplasms have been isolated from animals that were perfectly healthy. healthy. And here you find that in the North American side of Cyclops and Phyllis were there in bobcats, lynxes. Uh, pumas as well as Cotimundis, they were literally teaming with Babesia and Microti. Babesia, uh, unidentified Babesia and, micro, and Babesia Microti. And similarly, in the uh, jaguars of the South America, they were uh, they were uh, storehouses for uh, Cytoxin and Phyllis without any of the animals showing any clinical signs. All European foxes, most of them that were trapped and uh, blood analyzed showed Microti in their uh, blood. Uh, uh, similarly, for uh, in in the South uh, South Africa, the Serengeti, when there is an outbreak of uh, say genetic disorder or any other disease, when lions and other large villages breed for uh, the presence of uh, the presence of uh, DNA for these uh, pyroplasms, most of them turned up positive with Babesia and Cytoxin pellis. And in our recent outbreak at um, the girl forest where lions died in large numbers, uh, the primary cause was found to be CD, but Babesia has, uh, I believe, been isolated from or identified the DNA isolated uh, from some of the animals. Um, here we have palace cats of uh, the Mongolia, which were brought in to the US to the zoos, and uh, when their blood was screened, we had uh, an unidentified cytoxin, which they named as C. Manol. And uh, C. Phyllis has been identified from Koti Mudi uh, from Japan and other places. The only case where it was a cytoxinosis, a disease, was in the Central Asiatic cat, where it was uh, identified in the Mediterranean, which was actually clinically sick. So this shows us that uh, most of these animals have the parasites and live with them uh, peacefully forever. So that doesn't mean that disease doesn't happen. Uh, there is always uh, the possibility of an over disease happening in all these animals and uh, disease being transmitted. Uh, it, is a, it is an expanding field. So, for example, if you get any carnivore, it could, it could be a, a meerkat in uh, Africa or any uh, wild carnivore that you trap, you take the blood, you are in, invariably bound to find the DNA of any one of these pyroplasms, actually. Because they live in such a beautiful balance that uh, the disease doesn't happen. And you don't know when it will actually keep the balance and cause diseases, right? And I'm very sure that, you know, the, about uh, the epidemiology, the present episodiology of Babesia and other pyroplasms, Sanjeev will uh, give a very detailed uh, description in the next talk that's going to be following this. So what to consider after taking all this? The host susceptibility. You know, most of the hosts, uh, we, we will come to it how one disease can play havoc in one host in a sympathetic situation, whereas the others are uh, safe. So, host susceptibility is an important factor. We need to know some of the biology of the wild animals as well as the parasite to have a grasp of this. Virulence of the parasite. You know, uh, we all know that not all uh, genotypes of any parasite is uh, similar in virulence. Some of them are a little uh, slow, they don't cause disease, while others, they literally rip away the animal. So virulence of the parasite, we need to understand. <clears throat> Intermediate, oh, this is very important. In this uh, era where uh, we reach to places in the jiffy, there is every possibility that we transfer intermediate hosts also, either voluntarily or inadvertently. So a new intermediate host brought into a, 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 a niche where it is not present can actually spur the outbreak of a new parasitic disease in that area. Environmental factors, climate is changing, climate has become some, it has become warmer, it, it has uh, actually supported uh, the multiplication of uh, the vectors, the microclimate, geology, everything is changing. So all this have a telling uh, role or a, a telling effect on the parasite episodiology, parasite and the episodiology with the wild animals. Stresses, 
you know, we have had periods of uh, excessive rains, drought, temperatures. And of course, all this bring in uh, a difference in the availability of food, the malnutrition. All these factors have to be taken. Though it becomes a little difficult when it comes to a wild scenario where you don't know much, you no know, um, prior information of the animal. So as a veterinary parasitologist who is working with wildlife, you need to have an understanding of not just the parasite and the animal, but also the biome on the whole and uh, take everything into, into consideration before we make a decision. And the possible sources of parasites, you know, it is wide open. We never know what could be uh, holding a parasite. For example, Kotimundis in South America have been known to be reservoirs for T. Vancy. Now, uh, these animals don't actually show up the disease, but then they can always be the source for other animals which actually suffer from the disease. So we need to know the biology, the animals that uh, live in a sympatric situation and then whether they, uh, they can actually transmit the disease to the um, healthy animals. So with this, we start uh, my experience with parasitology how uh, sometimes I've been uh, stumped by the presence of parasites in apparently healthy animals. Now, this is one of the uh, cases of necropsy of a makna that I did. Makna, you know, uh, makna is a huge male with a, I mean, a male without a tusk. They're usually very big. They make up for the lack of tusk with their body size. This was a very large makna that actually got killed by electrocution in a tea estate in um, Godlo, near Godlo. <clears throat> and we got the scent of the carcass in about two days maybe this is the second day when we visited it the high tension wire had somehow strung too low about 10 foot and then this animal that was peacefully foraging had just stuck with the trunk and fell down dead which is nothing but criminal religion now for the young veterinarians i'd like to ask what are these white patches in the axilla and the groin region you know, in a couple of days, this whole elephant will become an ira with a white elephant. And these are the eggs of the maggots that are, you can see these, I mean, if you watch closely, billions of, I mean, lakhs of uh, blue bot flies sitting and mating here. They are waiting to start a life when one animal dies, actually, you know, in the jungle, death spurs life. And you will find that the entire place will be swarmed with millions of uh, blue bot flies trying to make the best of this huge carcass. And these white patches, they'll expand and eventually cover the entire animal and it'll look like a white ele elephant or whatever. Now, uh, this, uh, the cause of death is known to be electrocution, simply because, you know, electrocution, when it happens, uh, the male elephants, usually there is a relaxation of penis and then uh, ejaculation happens. We usually document that. Uh, and uh, we confirm basically by the singe mark and with elephants it is usually the trunk because that's the most inquisitive and prehensile part it'll go all around and touch the wire and immediately die you can actually see the imprint of the high tension wire on different places of the trunk this is the entry point where it has singed the, singed the skin and uh, caused imprint on the trunk and uh, this has actually brought down the elephant there is no other uh, infectious cause that we could do. And we also associate it with other necropsy lesions, like, for example, uh, an empty heart and uh, petechial hemorrhages of uh, um, uh, different uh, visceral organs and serous surfaces. And uh, we confirm that this is a case of um, death due to electrocution, not due to any infectious disease. Similarly, another case where uh, it was a sad tale of a cow elephant. The whole flock was here somewhere about 400 meters above. They were peacefully grazing when one of the calves, they ran to the edge and literally tumbled down. And uh, another uh, adult female tried to catch it and it fell down and uh, met its death down below in the rocks. The young calf got caught in the trees and was actually pulled into a small recess from where we rescued it. And uh, the work with us was now to whether see whether this was a mother or just not you know sometimes what happens is that a calf in a flock in a elephant herd is usually taken care of by so many other animals and any animal could have fallen down if this is a non and not the mother we could return the calf to the flock again we can take it up and leave it and but if this is the mother we'll have to take it and bring it up ourselves so that was the task so there was a group of veterinarians who took care of the calf and uh, myself and Venkataman, we were assigned to see whether this is a mother. And you know, this is an inaccessible place where we, we can climb up through ropes and reach there. And once we reach, we need to see whether it is a suckling mother, whether the mame may have milk. So that will be one uh, proof that that's a mother. 
but there is no way you can take it around. So we try to cut the animal and go through the thorax and check for the uh, mammary glands to see if it is a mother. And we eventually found out that it was a mother. So the death, it had lots of internal uh, organ damage and the death was due to the fall and not to any other cause. So these two animals were, we can con we say with a lot of confirmation that the death was due to other reasons than parasites. We found that the stomach was literally filled with cobaldia. This is something that most veterinarians who do an atropy of a wild elephant encounter. And if he's a new veterinarian, he's sometimes actually confounded. Could this be the cause of death? So uh, this, it is not in uh, hundreds, it is usually in thousands. We can actually scoop handfuls of, uh, hands full of uh, cobaldia from the stomach. Literally, it will be filled with cobaldia. And this from a healthy animal that has fallen due to, that has died due to another cause, tells us that how beautifully they balance their lives. Hundreds, and, I mean, literally thousands and thousands of cobalt are living peacefully with these animals. Was this ever the cause of death? No. Had I done a necropsy of this animal without knowing that it had fallen down, and had I not seen any other lesions, I would probably be tempted to actually close this necropsy by saying that this is the cause of death. So we need to be very careful in not simply associating the presence of parasites with death. So this is another example. Uh, I don't know how many of you can identify this exquisite, beautiful animal. This is a, a leopard cat, Prioronailurus bengalensis. And uh, I've uh, unfortunately had the opportunity to do necropsy on about uh, seven of them. <clears throat> and most of them were roadkill. They are very secretive nocturnal animals. And the presence of new, beautifully paved roads have actually struck the death knell for most of them because a uh, vehicle that is uh, that's being driven fast, it gives no chance for this beautiful animal to escape and most of them get killed. But one other striking feature I found with all these uh, necropsies is that the presence of stomach tumors. 100% of them had one, at least one large tumor actually taking up about 10% of the stomach area. So you can actually see the tumor from the furosa side and any such lesion in probably humans or any other animal would be taken as pathetic pathologic and it can cause impediment to the fun normal functioning of this stomach and could be assigned as a cause of death of this animal. So uh, opening up, I, this tells a lot of stories for somebody who you know, understands the biology of a wild animal. This is a very recent rat kill, very fresh. That means the animal has not been suffering from any kind of disease or impediment. It has been uh, able to live normally and hunt normally and here it has trapped a, a rat and it has chewed it up and almost partially digested. So the death is never due to the presence of the tumor. Probably one of the spiral tumors and you can see the hole that uh, actually communicates through with the exa being pumped and no other, you, we may probably say that this is slightly congested and uh, slight congestion can happen due to so, much, so many reasons and not definitely due to this. So here we can assign that the cause of death, we shouldn't jump and associate it with this pyruvate tumor but look for something else. So in all these animals, I have, we have found that the cause of death is usually the uh, aortic rupture. The sudden shock of a vehicle approaching is the cause of death. Here, this, this particular animal didn't have much damage. The thoracic cavity is intact. None of the rib is broken. Uh, because had the vehicle actually run over the thorax, it could still lead to uh, hemorrhage from the major organs. But here, all the organs were intact, but there's a pool of blood that's clotted in the thorax. That's due to aortic rupture, that is due to shock, uh, which usually happens when a wild animal suddenly sees something that it's not very familiar with. A vehicle that is very close with the sound, the light, it has caused a aortic rupture leading to the death of this animal. So in these two cases, we are seeing how the parasites are present and evidently numbers are more or there is a lesion, but still they are not the cause of death. So we need to bear this in mind when we investigate a case and try to associate it with the parasite uh, etiology. <clears throat> and uh, any of the veterinarians who have, who have done an necropsy of a leopard will uh, probably identify with this. It's a lung which is full of uh, apartments. You know, they live in beautiful uh, apartments where a pair actually holds up. Uh, they create a capsule and they live peacefully ever after. Uh, most animals, most of the leopards that die, they have uh, colonies and it is up to you to see, say whether this is the cause of death or this is just sitting there 
and the cause of death is something else. So let us not associate it directly with death. And the difference, you know, here this animal is actually run down a gore that was uh, uh, the for which we did postmortem in Bandipur. Uh, literally a run down gore which has not been having a healthy life, which is uh, which has not been feeding well. We know that uh, this is not the appearance of a gore. When we opened it, there was pallor all over. Uh, the animal had pallor. And you know, this is a post mortem impression where it has come out. Uh, most people, I, I did, uh, was a little stumped when I saw this first the impression on the liver. Lots of these building all over the carcass. You, you could literally pick out thousands from the peritoneal cavity and from every organ. Uh, this is from the vena cava, lots of them revealing in the vena cava. And uh, uh, this is from the ducts on the iota, and this is from the vena cava. We collected, this is just a sample of the population that was picked up from the carcass. Uh, we collected about uh, uh, 100 or 200 and there were still a lot more there, all of them live. I don't know whether the video works, try out. okay, here. So uh, this was fresh death and uh, most of these parasites, they are pentastomes uh, and overwhelming fulminating infection of, uh, with the pentastomes that had actually literally um, involved all the organs of this animal lots of lots and lots of them and uh, the number as well as the debility we sort of associated that the presence of these parasites somehow been, been an impediment for normal feeding and living of the animal and this is another cella case that we um, investigated uh, death of a, a lepo, uh, of a huge male tiger in its prime um, uh, this animal was actually uh, half submerged in the water and half of the anterior part outside and it had, we had signs of this animal uh, rolling over this place. Uh, the, uh, with investigation with the tribals, uh, we found that it was actually vocalizing in pain for the past uh, three days. And when we found that, uh, when we reached the place for necropsy, we found that it was a very huge animal. Look at the size of the paw, it's about 16 centimeters in its prime health. It had a very good fat depot. Um, Though it was a three-day-old carcass, some of the lesions were very well preserved. So the liver had become a mess. It, uh, usually that uh, autolyzes very fast. But look at the paintbrush hemorrhage is interesting. What is, is striking is for any pathologist to, or a veterinarian to open it, all these nodules that are uh, seen from the furosa, the extensive paintbrush hemorrhage of the intestines. And uh, this is more important and interesting, you know, the serosal tab. And these uh, rings of constriction, these were the ones that uh, told us that something was wrong inside. Uh, when we opened it, we found that the tears were actually anti-mortem. The tears were the reason for the colic. You know, you can see that the muscularis, has, uh, the serosa and the muscularis have torn, but uh, the entire uh, um, uh, layer is uh, not torn, it, it, is, it is closed. And you can see this edema and uh, congestion and hemorrhage in the border. That means it has happened prior to death. So something had contributed to such a lesion in the intestine. We found uh, seven such deep tears all over the intestine and about 28 nodules, um, huge nodules. And all these nodules were active. You must, uh, as a veterinary parasite, we understand what is an active nodule and what is a, an old chronic nodule. For example, in the case of visa system columbianum, nodular enteritis. In the case of an active nodule, you find the bleeding inside, active lesions inside, there will be blood. Whereas in the case of a nodule that, is, that has happened a long back, it is usually caseated and fibrous. Here we found active nodules with uh, submucosal uh, uh, hookworm, galonchus inside, lots of them. And you press it, you found lots of uh, bleeding from the intestine. And, you know, um, peristalsis is a highly synchronized uh, um, physiological activity, you know, muscles have to be in sync for the peristalsis to actually move and carry food. Uh, nodules can break this uh, synchrony and it can lead to, uh, the peristalsis can be actually, can cause a lot of pressure and these pressures have literally opened up the serosal surface, causing damage, pain and invasion of bacteria has led to the septicemia, which, which is uh, seen as a pain pressure hemorrhage. And so we could associate so this paper was published saying that uh, this is galonchus associated death because the lesion is there, the parasite is there, and death without any other. This animal had an empty stomach; it had not eaten anything for the past two days, and so uh, poisoning, which is one of the causes of death, either primary or secondary poisoning, was ruled out. So the cause of death was assigned to 
the hookworm that had caused lesion. But why did this uh, animal in its prime suddenly die due to hookworm? This is a mystery that we never know. We'll come to later. And this is a parasite that we took out from it. This is a, probably the only case where a wild animal has been uh, documented to have died due to galangus. We have had this disease uh, um, uh, seen in uh, captive animals, death or during necropsy. But uh, this is the only case where we found that a wild animal has actually died due to uh, submucosal hookworm. And this is a cross section where we found that they were actively chewing on the gut muscle, gut uh, tissue. And we have had, we do have so many other uh, instances where wild animals have literally died. This is an American wood duck that has died due to sarcosis. Look at the liver, look at the size look at the hemorrhage. It's almost like a pie cake with all these uh, sarcosis uh, cysts, literally. Almost probably if you take it, 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 it would take about 30% of the liver area. And such lesions can actually overwhelm and kill these wild animals also. Similarly, another case where the prey takes revenge on the predator. These, this is a dow, we know, with uh, the lesions of canker, ocular, I mean, uh, oral uh, trichomoniasis. And when such birds are picked out as weaklings and uh, targeted by kestrels and uh, peregrine falcons, they feed on it and ultimately succumb to disease. We have found, uh, I mean, there is a record of wild uh, raptors, falcons, falconiforms uh, dying due to fulminating uh, trichomonas of the muscle cavity. So these can happen in the wild. So uh, what is the role of a parasitologist or a veterinary engineer? I told you we found tigers which could have been in its prime, probably a six-year-old tiger which still had about uh, seven, eight years of life, suddenly dying due to parasitic disease and all these wild animals getting killed by parasitic diseases. So what is the role of veterinary engineer? It is very limited. We only document. As a veterinarian or a parasitologist who investigates the death of a wild animal, our primary aim is to see whether there is a human hand in it. So whichever way you look at it, we document everything. So what do we do for, a, uh, for, for instance, a case of a submucosal uh, hookworm in a tiger? I can't ask for 10 tigers for an experimentation, find out what is the epidemiology. Nobody knows how the disease is transmitted, especially for a sol solitary animal, which has about 40 square kilometer of uh, territory. Where did it pick up the disease? We never know. That might still be a mystery and that might be a mystery for a couple of years more because we'll never know it because the number of animals are limited. And even if we know, the intervention uh, role is very, very limited. We don't uh, treat these animals. There is no way we can actually put in something in the food and ask them to eat. Okay, we only document it. So we need to document and know that these uh, parasites can be cause of disease. Now, is there a place where we can, uh, where a veterinarian or pastoralist can play a role? Yes, there is. Now, how many of you can identify this animal? This is a beautiful, one of the intelligent animals called called as the Californian, sorry, sea otters. So uh, these are almost completely aquatic animals. Unlike the whales and the dolphins, they still have to, they, they, they do come to the surface. They never touch the land. Uh, the Californian sea otter can live its entire life in sea. If they want, they come out and float on the kelp beds. They usually feed on the, the mollusk and small uh, other vertebrates in the water. They're supposed to be one of the most intelligent animals. And during 2001, five, we, when I was in the US, uh, there were lots of such carcasses, an endangered animal, and lots of carcasses being washed uh, over in, in the sea. And uh, necropsy revealed that almost all of them have died due to toxoplasmosis. Now, uh, remember, these animals live about 200 miles off into the sea without any human contact. How do they virtually die of toxoplasmosis, which is a disease of cats, a terrestrial disease? We never know. They don't uh, hunt or eat any of the intermediate hosts, like, for example, uh, warm-blooded uh, uh, birds or rats. They live on mussels and uh, other uh, aquatic uh, food. So it was a big mystery how... Toxoplasma can reach an animal that lives about 200 miles into the sea in isolation. Now, not just Toxoplasma, there's a big investigation that was carried out uh, later and it was found that the cats uh, played a stellar role in the death of all these aquatic animals. Uh, Northern sea otters as well as Californian sea otters, uh, monk seals and different types of seals, spinner dolphins and various kinds of dolphins, they were uh, washing onto the shores dead due to Toxoplasmosis. And uh, a study by Kruder on the death of otters found that almost uh, uh, 30 to 40% of the deaths were, could be directly assigned to 
uh, encephalitis uh, and other acute toxoplasma lesions as well as about uh, 30 percent of those that had died due to shark bite they had shark toxoplasma encephalitis so these animals were uh, a kind of invalidated due to toxoplasmosis and they were not able to escape shark attack so the, that is a wonderful study. Actually, here the role of uh, the parasols actually went into an overdrive and how could something reach there? And it was found that there was no other animal that carried it. It was just that the drainage from uh, the major cities along the shores, California, San Francisco and other places, they were draining large quantities of um, sewage into the sea. Into the sea and killing these animals. That would uh, sometimes uh, sound incredible, but that's a fact. Has been uh, supported by evidence. You know, these are the favorite foods of all these animals, the mussels, and these you know that they are filter feeders. They filter literally uh, billions of liters of seawater. A mussel water comes in, it filters and throws away the crud, and any ooze is a single ooze that comes in, sits inside, doesn't get thrown out. So they become a, a kind of paratonic host. They actually accumulate ooze's, and even one ooze's in this animal. In, in this muscle, it is eaten by any one of them can actually result, potentially result in uh, fatal toxoplasmas in these animals, right? So here we see that the role of a parasite in actually bringing, bring, bring, these are all endangered animals and decline in their population, especially the Californian sea otters. And here we need to take a definitive role. And again, toxoplasmas in marsupials is a very big issue. You know, it all works with coevolution. Any animal that has lived with the cat uh, has actually uh, generated the wares to uh, uh, fight toxoplasmas. But those that have evolved in isolation, like for example, the macropods, the marsupials, they are highly susceptible. So, ex especially when they are brought to zoos in countries with lots of uh, stray cats, you must understand that there is always uh, the potential possibility of an episode of toxoplasmas happening. Uh, there is a lot of uh, doubt about this question, this particular question, and recently Thompson's paper uh, puts a doubt on it, but there is, he is uh, very skeptical whether they are uh, as uh, susceptible to toxicals as is uh, portrayed, but we must always understand when there is a case of a marsupial death, look for toxoplasmosis also. Okay. Sorry. So again, toxoplasma, uh, 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 dealing with toxoplasmosis, <coughs> all cats are uh, resistant, they don't die with toxoplasma. So suppose you, if you are uh, working with a palace cat, which is a very beautiful and uh, secretive cat of the Mongolia, they are susceptible to toxoplasmosis. This is uh, strange about evolution. This is the only feline that can be killed by toxoplasmosis. So, um, if it's a necropsy of a palace cat, there is intestinal lesion. It is almost like coccidiosis in a bird. You find all kinds of lesions in the intestine, and toxoplasma can actually kill a palace cat. <clears throat> Another important, uh, interesting uh, issue is about how a, sim a single parasite can deal with two animals in a sympathetic situation. And uh, this has uh, been a uh, cause of concern for uh, many of the epidemiologists and uh, uh, environmentalists. For example, on the left is the uh, Virginia white-tailed deer, order coil is Virginianus, which is very common in the, the, the over uh, America. Uh, anybody who has gone to any part of America would have uh, seen these uh, deer. And uh, these uh, do suffer from um, the big uh, facial, or the facial load is magna, but not as much as the other one. This many know as a uh, uh, moose, the largest uh, deer that is uh, there in the, on the there on earth, and this lives in the northern part of America and in the colder parts of Europe. This huge animal is highly susceptible to facial and magnet. So the migration of uh, Odocoilus virginia onto the northern colder parts has actually uh, been a cause of decline of many of these uh, moose. So, um, uh, there has been studies that have been conducted where these animals were uh, um, tagged with uh, uh, sensors, mortality sensors. Once they die and they don't move, they give a signal. And about <clears throat> 8 of the 14 animals uh, died in such a way, they had been found to be caused by extensive damage of the liver in by, by facial magna. So, moose actually is a dead end host for this particular. Uh, uh, parasite which can actually infect most of the archaeodactyles 
but moose is slightly different in that it can't tolerate even three to four of these parasites. They are very huge. Whereas the white-tailed deer do suffer from the disease, but they act as a host. They can actually transmit the disease. And the uh, migration of white tail onto the northern colder parts has uh, led to these animals dying due to facial odor magna. And again, the, the, another interesting part is that the facial odor is coming onto Europe. This is a, the magna is an American parasite. But in 2000, uh, they found deaths in the fallow deers of uh, Austria and uh, Czech Republic due to facial odor magna. And uh, here, it, the cause was due to uh, somebody bringing in either uh, in the in vector or probably the transfer of the deer or some other reason magna has been introduced into the europe and now it is uh, causing large outbreaks uh, uh, potential outbreaks in fallow deer and elk and red deer in europe and uh, you know the, the parasitic invaders they arrive together with the host and may infest native host species causing ex exceptionally negative impacts in their uh, new habitat. This is due to the missing co-evolutionary adaptation. The fallow deer has never seen a facial odor magnet during its evolution and uh, they don't have the wares to uh, counter the disease or to moderate it. They try to fight it and eventually that leads to a lot of mortality. So we must understand that how the same parasite can act differently in two different, almost similar hosts. Now, what is the role of veterinarian here? Aguirre uh, actually sums it up as what is called as a healthier future, where a human, humane, ecocentric approach with long time horizon, efficient resource planning. So, uh, take the case of uh, death of uh, Californian sea otters. What could a parasitologist do? He could probably understand, uh, tell them the life cycle, how uh, dumping untreated waste into the sea can actually um, cause decline in the population. Of, um, something that is living 200 miles in the sea. So active intervention in streamlining the waste management was taken up after the study, after they found out that, uh, you know, the sewage was getting uh, streamed into the sea and they were filtered by the mollusks and these mollusks were acting as a source for infection for uh, otters. And uh, uh, this actually led to uh, uh, shoring up their uh, sewage treatment uh, technique so that everything would be filtered and uh, these animals uh, not affected by Ooze is being inadvertently carried into the sea. And uh, in the second case, animal transportation quarantine. Quarantine plays a very important role. As a veterinarian, as a parasitologist, you need to know the essentials of quarantine. Any new animal brought in uh, to an uh, environment where it has not been living could either spell disaster for that animal or other similar animals living in the area. So the quarantine should not be just perfunctory. It should be perfect where a parasitologist goes through almost uh, the entire animal looking for the presence of even uh, asymptomatic presence of parasites so that it can all be removed before this animal is actually put back into the, uh, the natural environment. So uh, coming to captive wildlife, so we have uh, dealt with the uh, free ranging wildlife, coming to captive wildlife, it is almost like treating your sheep. For example, if you have a um, maggot in a sambar deer in an enclosure, it is uh, treating it is similar to treating a sheep with uh, magatone, but only question is the catch. You know, this is what takes most of your time, how to plan for uh, restraining that animal. You know, it is in a flock, you can't just walk in, they run off, you create a lot of stress to this animal. So you have to go through the entire process, the tranquilizing an animal just for uh, dabbing a little turpentine and uh, giving an a shot of ivermectin. So it is all the um, technology, how you approach the animal is different rather than the uh, treatment and control itself, which is almost like any other domestic animal in the zoo. But these days, you know, open enclosures or cages. Earlier, the, most of the zoos had cages where you could easily approach the animal and uh, take a sample or treat or whatever it is. But now, 90% uh, of the, after the implementation of the uh, uh, different measures of the Central Zoo Authority, you know, animals in cages have literally come down to zero in most of the zoos. Most of them are in almost uh, in a similar enclosure, like their natural enclosure, enriched enclosure, where you can't just approach it. For example, a tiger, which is showing signs of disease somewhere inside the moat, which is a big problem for you. You have to again either bring it into a squeeze cage and do it. So it becomes a little bit difficult. 
so again exchange of animals between zoos you know most uh, zoos keep an inventory of their animals and uh, they have their own methods uh, or uh, protocols for uh, disease control and uh, when uh, one animal is transported from a zoo uh, that is apt for a wild animal uh, lecture i think to call right okay so the exchange between uh, animals and zoos most animals they exchange an animal that goes from one zoo which is carrying a parasite Uh, into another zoo can actually potentially transmit disease, and the fourth problem is the rehabilitation of rescued animal. Now, these days everybody wants to call himself a wildlife rescuer or an environmental act activist. So they find a wild animal outside, they immediately take it, whether it's injured or not, they take it to the zoo. The zoo is supposed to bar admission of these animals simply because we never know what these animals are going to bring in for the other captive animals which are being treated. I mean, which are being maintained uh, in a secure way. but uh, zoo veterinarian is now um, not actually permitted to ask him to go away and take the animal away he takes it in and uh, treats it and probably leaves it in the enclosure which can be kept. the prescription for disaster so we have to watch against uh, introducing new animals from uh, animals that are rescued and brought in and act carelessly let into an enclosure now this is a picture that is most uh, despairing picture that uh, many of the uh, zoo veterinarians would have seen death of uh, both herbivores and carnivores due to tetrasomosis tetrasomosis is one of the major killers in uh, of uh, sorry major killers of uh, carnivores in most of the zoos unfortunately and uh, you know uh, strangely you know while tetrasomosis is found in many of the animals in the wild I have uh, never found a single paper of a wild tiger or a lion getting killed with tetrasomosis actually documented evidence is very very low the dna has been found in many of the animals but not over disease but tetrasomosis takes a heavy toll of carnivores in a zoo um you know uh, nobody would actually forget nandan can an experience where about 12 animals died in the span of about 3 4 weeks which brought in a lot of bad pressure for the entire zoo that day and uh, most of you would also have uh, seen uh, such news clippings where uh, people accuse the zoos of feeding animals with uh, rotten meat uh, they want the animals to be fed with uh, uh, prime meat uh, fresh meat now uh, here's where the biology works a little you know how a carnivore usually a tiger usually kills and eats a Uh, deer in the forest uh, if it is not too hungry it usually kills it and lets it down it just uh, licks a few uh, drops of blood and then allows the it visits the carcass repeatedly and eats it by the time the carcass is actually putrefied it uh, likes to eat slightly uh, putrefied carcass so uh, tryptosomes tryptosomes usually die within um, 12 hours or 20 20 hours in in a carcass so in the wild they usually go for putrefied uh, meat and this putrefied meat is actually good for these animals are we doing a mistake by giving these animals fresh meat because when 12 animals die due to tryptosomas almost at the same time the emphasis should not be on a vector transmitted uh, mode but due to oral uh, something that's transmitted to meat So suppose the carcass of a buffalo which had died due to tryptosomas had been brought in the previous day and all these animals had been given a share of that meat fresh meat there is a pot potential possibility that all these animals get infected at the same time due to uh, tryptosomas and die but this is something that we can't recommend asking people to look for uh, i mean uh, to let the meat rot for a while and then give it to these animals uh, instead it is up to the veterinarian there or a parasitologist to monitor every batch of uh, meat that is brought in take a, a blood smear or something like that and look and confirm that there is no uh, tetrasome present so that it can be fed this is not uh, very difficult also you know most of the staining techniques it takes me at the most half an hour as soon as the carcass comes in you just take uh, dab a couple of uh, uh, portions or if it's the same one carcass just take a couple of smears and examine no tetrasomes it is free to i mean we can uh, it could still have uh, occult uh, tetrasomes somewhere but if there are not many tetrasomes we can be sure that there is no uh, potential possibility of the disease to uh, get transmitted and of course acarya is in captive situation this is a carpet python which is literally flooded or uh, uh, with uh, ticks 
uh, ticks in uh, snakes is a big problem in most of the zoos and uh, you know you can't just pick them out and uh, treat it there are not enough papers unfortunately that uh, tell veterinarians what to do in case of uh, 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 acariosis in uh, snakes one of the safest drug for uh, uh, other animals like cypermethrin it has not been uh, properly documented in snakes and most uh, veterinarians uh, shy away from cypermethrin because of there is a single paper that says that uh, they can cause uh, death in uh, uh, reptiles but it was found to be untrue because uh, when uh, i took uh, our interns uh, and the tracking students to the zoo we found that our cobras in the wandlu zoo were uh, having uh, ticks this is another reason is rescue you know people rescuing cobras anyway they want to leave it in the zoo they bring it and then the zoo authorities have to take it and they leave it in the enclosure in a closed enclosure it can actually multiply in large numbers so all these cobras had uh, ticks and we made the students actually uh, have a look at them and uh, we taught them how to uh, detect with cypermethrin we had controls and we found the cypermethrin is very safe even for snakes yeah, so we can spray it uh, spray the environment and uh, uh, be sure that the, the animals won't die and the ticks will get killed avian malaria is another big problem in uh, the captive environment where many birds live in a limited area this actually happened in uh, 1998 i think where large number of uh, citizens conures peach faced lovebirds they were dying in numbers large numbers literally it was wiping off the aviary and nobody suspected uh, malaria they were trying to look for uh, feed toxicity this and that and one bird i took an impression of the liver and look at the intensity of parasite almost 70% of the cells from peripheral blood they were infected with malaria so we took up mosquito control and uh, other measures and we could bring down the death and finally uh, stomp it out from the aviary so uh, what are, what do these uh, instances speak to you know regular measures should have something put up actually i'll deworm all these animals on this particular day it need not that there need not be an overdoing of deworming at least one or two because we know that these animals don't have access to the outside world so uh, if you deworm and uh, cleanse uh, the environment once you can be sure that they'll be rid with rid of parasites for a long while uh, vaccination is very important you know anything that comes in like for example december can um, stir up a hidden uh, case of uh, babesia in, in these animals uh, dipping also can be done should be done in all for all these animals and then effective feed and fodder management done uh judiciously will keep down most of the parasitic diseases and of course as parasitology is the same you know looking for parasites it can you can either be antibodies when an animal is it's difficult to get material you know you can ask a veterinarian from a tiger that becomes a one week exercise for him getting permission from the forest authorities from the director of the zoo and then uh, putting everything ready and then uh, uh, knocking the animal down or putting it in the squeeze cage it is actually compli- it complicated so when there is a, an emergency like you want to trans- transport one animal from one enclosure enclosure to other and even you have to invariably uh, uh, either put in a squeeze cage or strangle it during those times take blood take feces take everything and do a screen so looking for parasites in living or dead any animal that is dead again has to be screened for the presence of any parasite that has not shown up Look for physical symptoms. A veterinarian parasitologist can actually look for that. Uh, you know, uh, trying to weigh the animals frequently. And one of the methods is to look for biomarkers. What we are uh, we have assigned one student for this, looking at the cortisol level and uh, see how it actually uh, tells us about the well-being of the animal. So parasite, there is no difference. You know, uh, it is not that parasites don't get. Uh, I mean, uh, wild animals don't get affected. There are established, uh, do- documented evidence of that show that uh, treated animals do well than untreated animals. Grouse treated with that animal, they had more eggs. Tits, blue tits uh, were better off with treatment. There, these are all for uh, captive animals. Delivery of uh, antelope, uh, antelope improved survival of sheep. Uh, and then uh, finches with inter- insecticide soaked nesting materials <coughs> resulted in more survival so there is a role for para- parasitologists to play there it is not that all these animals don't need you but you know uh, the role is has to be played judiciously 
and of course there is not much of a difference uh, here are the list of uh, drugs that are commonly used for helminth and i'm sure uh, sanjay will touch up on uh, what are the drugs that are used for uh, Uh, blood parasites, uh, including Babesia, you know the same whatever is used because nothing is off the counter uh, permitted for uh, uh, wild animals. But whatever you use for uh, an equal and carnivore can be extrapolated to wild animals. And uh, the last part is the zoonosis. Uh, you know the forests have literally shrunk and fragmented. You see wildlife where you've never seen them before. Uh, close interaction between wild and domestic animals. We have uh, homegrown and uh, Armchair environmentalists who want to do something for the environment and try to bring in an animal that is normally healthily present, and then increased wildlife activism and the emergence of new parasites—all of them put us at uh, risk with uh, zoonotic diseases from wild animals. And uh, the role of veterinarian and the veterinary parasitology is even more important these days, where especially like COVID, any new parasite can actually cause a pandemic in humans. So all this, what is commonly found in uh, domestic animals, can be potentially zoonotic causes, partially zoonotic causes for either wild veterinarian or zoo veterinarian, and uh, it's up to the parasitologists to let them know what could be a hazard there. And recently, uh, IVRA they have found evidence of cyclinal line wild boar. I don't know whether it's the tip of an iceberg or it is something that is a standalone uh, case. But we need to be wary because uh, trichinellos. We have all the biological uh, uh, factors present in India. Only that the disease is not there. So once it is introduced, we have wild boars, uh, carnivorism, uh, merging of uh, sylvatic and urban cycles. So it is not uh, long before this can be a disease of our domestic animals. With that, I conclude my talk on uh, this. I thank you. I hope I have not taken more time. Thank you so much, sir. It was indeed a delightful and inspiring presentation. Interest in the parasites of the wildlife has increased manifold in the recent years. Now I request the participants if there is any query. From the audience, please drop into the chat box, and we will request our eminent speaker to answer the same. Venerable sir, there is a question from one participant, Dr. Mohanty. Banner uh, against wild canids and felids. Sorry, I couldn't uh, hear you. Yeah, yeah, please, please. Can I repeat? Yeah, please. Sir, kindly stop sharing the presentation. Then yeah, it yeah, will yeah. be. I'll be stop. Yeah, thank yes. you. Yes. Can we use the fluoralanol drug against ticks in wild canids and felids? Uh, you can. I don't think there is any bar on using it. But uh, where would you get the chance to use it on a wild canid? Probably you are talking about a zoo situation, right? If it is a zoo, there is. I don't think there is any bar on using it. Um, uh, it has been tested uh, quite well in uh, carnivores, and it's a safe drug. You can definitely try to use it in wild animals. Wild animals definitely, because uh, you know you spend it, it costs around two thousand or for a dog, probably. Here it's a costly drug. You can definitely use it for a uh, wild animal. Sir, there is another question. Please yeah. highlight on the of paragonimiasis, which is nowadays commonly reported from the free-ranging tiger and leopard of central India. Oh, roti. Uh, please what, highlight what? the genetic aspect of paragonimiasis. Yeah, yeah. Which is commonly reported. Yeah, uh, true. As I showed you, I have I've never seen a single carcass that was free of paragonimus. So a single, single leopard carcass that didn't have paragonimus. It is uh, present in most of these animals, but uh, at the same time, I don't know whether there are as many cases of paragonimus in humans because you know though leopards uh, are very versatile, uh, they can uh, there, there is the concept of urban leopard. Hello. They come into the. Uh, Dr. Sri Kumar, I am Dr. K. P. Yeah. 
uh, there are few reports uh, uh, reported in a human uh, from I that uh, paragonimus. Yes, it could be. Okay. But what I'm saying so, is, so it's a it's a genotic. But I am dealing with paragonimus in Central India. I have reported many from leopards and tigers. So I would like to know about what are the uh, precautionary measures to overcome the disease to other part uh, and and genotic aspect. Please throw light. See, yeah, uh, thank you, sir. As I said, you know, it is present in most carnivores, pellets and uh, I mean leopards and tigers. With tigers, there is no issue with humans simply because tigers are uh, specialists. They don't venture into human environment. Whereas uh, leopards are, uh, they you call them urban leopards. They can walk into your environment. Uh, for example, uh, they can defecate near your uh, uh, water body and then infect or in a common water body from which we draw uh, uh, water. But still, the rate of infection in human is very low when compared to the number of animals that we find in infected in uh, wild. So, is there a way? It is simple, you know, the, you know the life cycle, how you get uh, paragonimosis. It is usually for people who go to the uh, water body and eat animals uh, or uh, invertebrates from that area without cooking. So, simple precautionary measure of not eating anything in the wild will actually protect you from most of the... Uh, Sir, there is one question from Dr. Uh, Sundar Rajan. Rather the Cobaldi Pentelis maggot. Sir, sir, sorry, 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 I am interrupting. Sorry, sorry, I am interrupting. That is, yeah. There is one question from Dr. Sondhya Rajan whether the Cobaldia infantilis maggot or not. The question was whether uh, Cobaldia is uh, fatal to the animal. Uh, I, I'm not still didn't get your question. Can you repeat it? Yeah. Can I can I ask, uh, sir? Hello. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, maybe Nilesh, you can repeat the question. Hello, hello. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Sir, you are requested not to ask questions directly. Yeah, please, please, yeah. It is requested to put it on in chat box so that we can ask. If yeah, everyone yeah. will ask, then there, this will be a fish market, sir. Exactly. Sir, there is another question. What are the points yes. that should be taken into consideration while taking any research problem in wildlife so that there, uh, the student should not face any, face any issue in the publication? Uh, Nilesh, before I answer this, can you go back to the previous question? I, I think I have not answered that uh, about uh, Cobaldia. Can you just repeat it? Cobaldia. 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 Ah, sir, Cobaldia. the last question was whether the Cobaldia elephantalis maggots are pathogenic or not. It is not. Whether the Cobaldia elephantalis maggots are pathogenic or not. Yeah, as yes. I told you, we have had uh, uh, Cobaldia has been present in 100% of uh, elephants that we have uh, necropsy. And in all these animals, Death has been due to so many other established reasons like falling down, electrocution, and you find them in literally thousands. So I would always be very wary before I take up a uh, stance that this is what causes the disease. So Cobaldia is something that has co-evolved beautifully with elephants. And even in large numbers, we need more evidence to say that they are pathogenic. Right now, I would say that they are not pathogenic and uh, uh, an elephant can usually tolerate lots and lots of Cobaldia. Thank you. Now, the next question is about... Uh, what kind of uh, uh, project I can take in wildlife? I, I, I don't know whether I can answer it uh, straight, simply because in uh, when, I, when it comes to Tamil Nadu Forest Department, we, I find it very difficult to get permission for even minor interventions. So we, uh, we recently we submitted a proposal for uh, finding out the parameters for elephant health, and uh, we got a reply saying that we already have done that. We, do, we, don't, we don't want anybody else to do it or something like that. So it depends upon your first department, but Kerala, they have been more uh, forthcoming. They have actually taken up uh, the role of veterinarian doing research a bit more uh, openly than in Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu is the uh, forest department concerned. I don't know about yeah. your state, but always be wary that uh, you are dealing with uh, scheduled one animals in a reservoir uh, situation where your uh, presence is not welcome. 
So you take up. That's the reason most of the studies in uh, Chennai have been on uh, dung, because if it's dung, you, they, they allow you to collect anything else beyond that that requires you to be there and uh, collect blood or study the animal. There is always a level of uh, resistance from forest authorities. So if it is not for disease, it is simply for uh, uh, the facilitation. It is very difficult to get uh, yeah, permission yeah. for such diseases, for right. such projects. That depends on how your uh, form yeah, yeah. State yeah. for department will work. Uh, interesting, sir. Then, sir, there is one more question from Dr. Mohante. Uh, in yeah. some states, big yellow meat due to the prohibition of cow slaughter, can there be clinical form of enteritis due to sarcosis fusiformis in such cases? Sorry, Nilesh, I mean, sir, can you repeat okay. it? Oh. Uh, in some states, pets are fed buffalo meat due to the prohibition of cow slaughter in that state. Can there be clinical cases of enteritis due to sarcosis fusiformis in such cases? It has uh, not been documented anywhere. And, and as far as I can see, most of these coccidians, uh, they don't cause an over disease in uh, pellets. Um, and I don't know if there are uh, known instances where uh, positive meat has been fed and uh, the results studied. But as far as I know, sarcosis has not been a problem. Uh, for uh, large pellets in any of the zoos that uh, I, I have known. Thank you. So there is another question from Dr. Rafiq Shahadar. Can you throw some light on the histomoniasis in the captive birds? Uh, I have not come um, um, across a case of histomoniasis in wild captive birds. We have had instances where uh, turkeys and uh, other birds, domestic birds have died. And in the wild, of course, uh, if you take up uh, fowl, there are instances where uh, wild turkeys of North America have been uh, shown um, uh, uh, with uh, histomonosis. But I have not come across, but histomonosis can be a problem in uh, captive uh, turkeys, not in the wild as much. Because, you know, it's a disease that is a reflection of uh, poor management and uh, such things. Where a buildup is required uh, for a disease to happen usually doesn't happen in the wild because you know they are equally dispersed. There is never a situation where it is overcrowded. But in such situation, it can happen. There are records of histomonosis in wild pheasants and birds, but uh, I have not come across it. But it can happen. Thank you, sir. There is a question, Dr. Arshvinder Singh. Uh, if we found capillaria in the bird intestine, if we found capillaria in the bird intestine, what are the precautions should be taken? Uh, which bird? Uh, for captive. the captive birds. Is it dom uh, captive wild birds? Uh, see, I, 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 capillaria, yeah, capillaria can, uh, it is normally found in most of the captive birds that we have. Uh, we uh, spray egg or a couple of eggs is not going to do any uh, to be a, much of a significance. You can just treat it. There is no other thing that you need to do because captive birds are always easy to intervene and treat. Wild birds always have capillaria. Uh, there is no question about it. Any wild bird species you collect, you will find uh, uh, dual plugged eggs there. And most of these birds are healthy. They don't uh, usually show up any signs at all. Okay, sir. So Please name some funding agency that readily give fund for the wildlife parasitology projects. Yeah, actually, you can uh, su submit uh, to uh, Ministry of Environment for us. They require a lot of funding and any other. Um, uh, you know, I have a list of uh, funding agencies that I have that we usually submit uh, projects. I can actually communicate to the uh, organizers. You can actually make it public in the chat room. Uh, chat box, you can probably uh, uh, allow people to have a look at it. I, I can send you a list actually. Thank you, sir. Now there is some time constraint. I request uh, the rest of the participants, if there's any question remain unanswered during the session, please post it into our Facebook page. Therefore, uh, thereby, you could get the reply from our speakers. Uh, thank Sorry. you, sir. Such a compilation uh, of the white. Apologies for overshooting this. Um, uh, I thought uh, I was on time because uh, anyway, thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot for everybody for uh, patiently listening to this lecture. And uh, I'm and now I guess Dr. Pisar and then Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay.
Okay, now uh, uh, I will present a word of thanks for the sir. A wise man said, a united mind is the most powerful weapon on the earth, above the earth, under the earth, and this can be gained only through such kind of deliberation. It is obviously a lifetime cherishable opportunity to listen to Dr. Shiri Kumar, which can't be forgotten by any of the us. Such a compilation of the wildlife cases are rare to find anywhere. The presentation was indeed very interesting and the inspiring one. It was indeed a very good deliberation for the diagnosis and control of parasites in the wildlife. Sir has shared his wide, exhaustive information on the wildlife parasitology and enlightened the path of several veterinarians and budding veterinarians aspiring of the working in the wildlife. From the Luas family, we are highly thankful to you, sir, for sparing your valuable time and enlightening the path of several budding veterinarians in parasitologists like us. Thank you once again, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sanjay Kumar, sir. Our principal scientist, Nuclear National Research Center on Infly. Dr. Sanjay Kumar has completed his uh, graduation from Haryana Agriculture University, sir. Most graduation from CCSJ, sir, or by PhD from the same university. He has worked a lot on his activity of ABC equi merogoids in donkeys and identification of immunodominant polypeptides. <laughs> there are many fellowships on ours is credit. We got the postdoctoral fellow from the Japan Society for Promotion of Science in the year 2004. Then PGD PMA, that is the postgraduate diploma in technology management in agriculture in the year 2012. Yes, 22 years more than research experience. A lot on parasitology. He has guided many students, more than students in PhD. He is actively involved in many projects. There are three international projects to his credit. Most uh, equine parabolic winning laboratory project and equine parabolic between National Center for Protogen Japan and National Research Center of Equine. The second one is the establishment of international diagnostic methods for parabolic by a ring trial. This is a multi-laboratory project and uh, their laboratory is one of the component in that. And development of antigen detection and rapid diagnostics for equine parabolic These are the three international projects he was uh, handling. And he has also completed more than many national projects. And uh, there is um, a dozen of inter institutional projects, which is uh, PI and co-PI. Now, I request Dr. Sanjay Kumar sir, to move forward with his Hello. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mana, for the brief introduction. Thank you very much uh, for giving me an opportunity to act as a speaker. I am audible to all. It is okay. My voice is okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. So, friends, uh, I will be. Uh, speaking specifically on the equine paraplasmosis uh, because this is the area of my research and I am doing uh, research on in this field of research. So uh, I will be find uh, touching this epidemiology, vector biology, risk factor, and I will also share some of my research finding in this area and that the research that our lab has done, and then I will. So you know that. Uh, Epicomplexion parasite is a very big phylum and uh, it encompasses the plasmodium also, coccidia, plasmodium, cryptosporidia, and this is the animal Babesia and Cleria falls here. And uh, <clears throat> the animal protogen parasite are uh, the, now the question is why they are epicomplex, why this is a, a very big phylum and why this is epicomplex. Because if you see the structure of the parasite, they have some apical organelles here. If you see here, they have some apical organelles. Uh, these are the ropetri protein, 
and I named here microneems, dense granules, apical coloring, spherical bodies. So these help the parasite in uh, internalization in the infected RBC. They diffuse some proteases enzyme that break the RBC membrane and then they go to inside. This is the common pathobiology of all the epicomplex in parasite. That is why they are called epi and these rock tree proteins and dense microneme have been used by many workers as a vaccine or as a drug or as a diagnostic candidate. And you can see, I put some picture of the Tetraria equi, and these are the many Tetraria equi. That is why it is called epicomplexin parasite. So there are many hemoprotein parasites of the animals. Uh, the most important is the Tetraria annulata in the cattle, and the Tetraria equi in the equine. They are most pathogenic. Uh, previously, Thelira equi was the Babesia equi. We know it very well, but a uh, few years back, it has been renamed as the Thelira equi because the fact that the Thelira equi has the schizogen, has the schizones, as the Thelira annulata. So that is why it has been renamed as the Babesia equi. Babesia lacks the schizogenic phase in its uh, cycle, life cycle. Thelira parva is another parasite. It is in South Africa. It is not present in India. Babesia bijamna, Babesia bovis, Babesia canis, Babesia gypsum is the problem in India, very big problem. Babesia bovis is more pathogenic than the Babesia bijamna. Obvious and Babesia kabali in India, it is less pathogenic, but we have not reported it in India. It is not quite prevalent. And anaplasma is the cat cell parasite, that is another parasite. So in nutshell, these are the major parasites. Of course, there are very long list in the domestic animals and the companion animal. Uh, but very long. But just uh, for the uh, for your education purpose, I put a small list here. And uh, basically, I will be dealing with the Thelaria equi. But its pathobiology, we can uh, you can uh, collaborate with the other uh, domestic animals also. Now, if we see the its epidemiology is very quite spread. These are the taken from the OI website. You can see this all the uh, these are the endemic red zone is the endemic area and no document and the uh, possible occurrence. You can see the India is highly endemic to the babesiosis and anaplasmosis, and, and the rest part of the world are also there. You can see almost it is quite prevalent in the uh, tropical and the subtropical parts of the world. Of the few area are not infected, like this is America and uh, this is Mongol, because they are a very highly uh, temperate or cold region of the, of the world. And Africa also, some of the regions are not there. Uh, in India, bovine tropical thaleresis is also very, very prevalent, very highly prevalent. And same with it, uh, thalera equi infection is very high. Prevalent. You can see the whole country. This is absent in the high altitude area, high altitude area. This region. And you can see the, uh, it's collaborating with the, it is cattle population. Where is the cattle population is more, this incidence of this more, because they are tick transmitted and when the ticks comes in the very close contact with the animal, it get infected and then it uh, affect the other, another animal. So that is why uh, it is uh, can copy with the cattle density or animal density. And uh, yeah, this is the distribution uh, uh, result figure is the equine pyroplasmosis in the world. You can see that previously we are considering that uh, America was the not uh, was not reported for the equine pyroplasmosis because if you read the old literature. Few countries like America, USA, uh, sorry, Brit Britain, London, and the Australia, Japan were free of this condition. But now this is not the case. Even the America has recorded the case of the equine pyroplasmosis because they got infected animal from the Mexico, and then of course they controlled it. But still, in some region in Texas, it is highly endemic and prevalent. Uh, and of course, you cannot see India, but uh, the thing is that. Uh, we are not transmitting the figures to the OI. That is why it has not uh, put it red. Of course, it is a red figure in India. It is highly endemic, highly endemic in India. The idea is to share, show here the uh, outbreak in America. That is why. And in other country also, it has been reported from Australia and from Britain also. If we see that the uh, protozoan parasite is a serious threat, and it is a more attention is recorded needed because it is more responsible for the economic losses to the animal husband as they are very difficult to control and parasite has a better capacity to overcome host resistance 
and uh, if vector is much difficult that is why it is quite prevalent the vector control is not possible and that is why disease is very difficult to control and our most of the population are endemic to the uh, clery annulata and the <coughs> clery equi and uh, uh, environment our tropical environment favor the propagation of the ticks and the ticks are very common to the cattle and the equine the same tick is responsible for the clery annulata and the same hyloma is responsible for the clery equi and whenever there is campaign uh, the animals are kept together like, like the equines are kept with the cattle of buffalo the, the ticks jump from the one animal to the another animal and that is why the uh, the the infection remains in the uh, in the uh, in the field and then it, we cannot control it and there is drug resistance is coming on that is why we are looking for the new drug and drug targets and it is very difficult to find a vaccine candidate of course diagnostic technique we have strengthened but likewise we need a vaccine and the parasitic disease uh, very difficult to prepare a vaccine because the one vaccine is not uh, <clears throat> may not control the everything and uh, because the parasite are very smart they change their antigenicity and uh, host range is also very wide so that is why vaccine we cannot have a vaccine even for malaria also because that is also uh, part of the complex and the, uh, that is why it is very difficult to control this paras protozoan parasitic disease in the field and uh, the latency is very high in the field and that latency affect our husbandry and uh, the animals act as a nucleus herd for maintaining the uh, infection in the live animal and in the uh, in the tick that is the, the tick become infected and then they remain carrier uh, if we say that the clearia quai uh, the animal once get infected to the clearia quai it remains carrier throughout its life you can see the damage how much it will cost once animal is infected it will remain carrier and there is still there there is no drug which can make it negative for the clearia quai and it became a nucleus for the spread of infection to the other animal and that is why uh, it is uh, and whenever there is any uh, any physiological stress or other things are there uh, the animal the, this disease flare up and they also affect the performance or the product productivity of the animal and whenever there is physiological or mental stress is there these disease flare up and cause the clinical they convert latency to the clinical infection of the animal so this is an estimate of the, the our exotic breeds are more sensitive more resist more sensitive to this type of things and this is just for the cattle and they and they are causing causing large uh, economic losses in the form of the large peri urban and exotic breeds in india are very for the this is for the cattle not for the mice and uh, our jibu cattle is much more resistant for the uh, this peri annulator and according to an estimate uh, the cost per treatment is the 4.55 us dollar this is a very old figure but we can revise it uh, because, but there is a, i cannot find such data for the indian context that is why i have to copy this from a, from a reference article so this is you see how much cost a farmer for treatment and once the animal is infected it will remain carrier and it is more costly to uh, to cure the east coast fever the clearia parva 40 dollar you can see Uh, and this cost is uh, dear to the animal and we can see the how much economic losses and this is not for me to, uh, we can copy it man this is 239 million dollar this is loss to the industry and you can see how much how much economic losses it is causing to the our animal has bandit and to the poor farmer we can think of that is why management is the better way to control this infection you can see that the india is Uh, horse population has decreased uh, regarding now we have uh, roughly 11 lakhs of the animal but uh, still we have to find out uh, what are the direct infection and uh, we can say that uh, if uh, our uh, direct infection total per year is 102 billion dollar the losses to the us uh, due to this equine is has been raised because if we Uh, take care of all the losses to the workers and the animal and the uh, and the economy of the race horses like that in america mostly race horses there that is why 
the losses are very high, but uh, we can not say that uh, uh, the losses in India also very high because uh, our, we do have the race industry and the poor farmer. Of course, now the, the coins uh, charm has decreased in the population, but the losses is still remaining. That is why the farmer are not so much interested in keeping the coins nowadays. Okay, now the coming to the etiology. Uh, there are two equine pyroplasmas is caused by the two parasites, Pavesia, Kabali, and Thelira equine. So Thelira equine is small form of the parasite, it is more pathogenic, and Pavesia Kabali is the large form of the parasite, and it is uh, less pathogenic, and uh, in the field, uh, mostly 3 or 4 percent parasitemia is there uh, in the clinical cases, but Thelira equine can go much higher. Uh, maybe 10 or 2, 15 percent of the parasite may be infected in a clinical case if you observe in the field. So this is the life cycle in that cell. This is the ticks that inject the sporozoites to the infected animal. And these are the stages which are in the ticks. The gamete ticks infect, the tick ingest gametes from the host and they convert to the zygote, zygote to the sporozoite, and the sporozoite, they are injected through proboscis to the infected animal, they convert to the merozoite. And these are different stages. Uh, we can appreciate all these stages in our in vitro culture system that we have uh, established at NRC. Uh, let us understand in another way. These are the sporozoite that are ingest, uh, injected to the host by the tick bite, and the first they go, this is the shyzogony, that is, not that was absent in Babesia and it is only present in the Thaleria annulata. They go to the PBMC and then they make microsagents and that these microsagents, they burst and they release the mirozoids. And these mirozoids, they infect the RBC. And that is why these mirozoids, they multiply, go and multiply within the uh, red blood cells. And this is how the infection, uh, the pathobiology of the clear aqua goes or the like uh, or clear annuita, they are they are responsible for the destruction of the RBC in the animal and the animal become weak and the hemoglobin level goes down. But in horses, uh, the hemoglobin urea is not the first sign as observed in the babesiosis or the period because the equine has a very good threshold for the hemoglobin. They do not uh, uh, vent it out of the body. The kidney has a very high threshold level for the hemoglobin. That is why we observed the hemoglobinuria in equine in the last stage. And uh, at that time, the hemoglobin level is around three or four. And it becomes difficult to save the life of the animal. And then this cycle is in the ticks. The tick injects the zygote and then the gamogony and sporogony. And the, ultimately, this is, these are the sporozoites in the salivary gland of the ticks, infected tick. I will show you this slide how the salivary gland looks like uh, once they are uh, uh, become ballooned in the infection. Uh, and uh, of course, they are threat to the uh, equine industry. And the, these are the tick species which are responsible, Hyloma, Rifis, Pallas, Dermacentura, Aphrygetic vector. And uh, okay, this is figure uh, yeah, by the Tick and tick bone disease in, in India is around 498 million per annum. This is a figure, Indian figure. Loss due to tick, tick, tick bone disease in India around 498 million per dollar. And this is figured in 2003. And now 17 years, uh, you can just scale up this figure, how much losses we are having from the tick and tick bone disease. All tick and tick bone disease in India, we can scale up. And uh, you can think of how much economic losses we are having. And uh, this disease is very quite prevalent in all the regions of the world, and almost all the tropical and subtropical part of the world. Some regions are not explored, but the disease is quite prevalent. Yeah, this is the sporozoite in this library gland. You can see how this balloon, these are the SNI, single SNI, how they are get balloon. In the, and these are the normal SNI. This figure is showing the normal SNI, the part A in the insect. And these are normal, and that then they are having these sporozoites. They are having these sporozoites. You can see all these sporozoites. And the infected ticks, they inject these sporozoites from the slavery gland to the horse. 
and this sporozoite then ultimately go to the PVMC, then they complete their cytogony. Macrocytes are formed and ultimately they release the neurozoite and the neurozoite they get the uh, infected ticks. So, okay, we conducted one study uh, uh, because we want to know if a, uh, if an animal is harboring the ticks, whether the ticks are infected to it or not. So, we collected 52 samples and the ticks also from the same animal. And then we screened the serum for the, with the ELISA. And then we uh, collected the DNA also from the host DNA. And then we, we also extracted the DNA from the slavery gland, blindly. blindly. Uh, of course, the, in serum, it is very easy to demonstrate the antibodies. All, in, uh, out of 52, nine animals were positive in the ELISA, and nine were positive in the PCR. And out of nine, the ticks which were collected from this animal, six ticks were positive. So it means that animal, the ticks which are attached on the animal body, uh, on the body of the infected animals, it is quite possible that these ticks will be infected and they will make the other animal also infected. And these are the salivary glands from this infected. You can see the how much infection is there. Very much hypertrophy is there of the SNI. And this is very high prevalence sporogyte infection. So this study has demonstrated that ticks which are attached on the body of the animal of the infected animals are also invariably uh, are infected and they are threat to the other net animals when they get, because tick have to be drop off to complete its cell life cycle, and it must attach to a new, new animals. So when the, it drop off, uh, and, but in Thaleria annulata, there is no trans ovarian transmission, like in Babesia. Only transteral transmission is there for the, uh, so uh, ovarian is more dangerous because the, once the tick infected, it will remain infected throughout its life. The ovaries are infected, but it is transtadial. It will be transferred to the nymph and then the larva, nymph and the adult. Then it will disappear. Okay, this is the another uh, another figure, the PCR figure. We are showing the PCR positivity is there, and then the we sequenced and we demonstrated that the it is really the we can demonstrate that these PCR bands are really of the Thaleria quai, and we made the phylogenetic tree also just to uh, demonstrate the there's something here. Okay, so we did another study how the infected RBC looks like. So these are uh, RBC, infected RBC were collected from the donkeys, and you see that change in shape of the RBC. And these are the granular shape of the infected RBC. You can see these spikes, these spikes in the infected, this one in the infected RBC, and this is the normal RBC. So this makes the RBC less fragile. We say that uh, why the erythrolysis is there because the infected RBC they become more fragile because there is increase in total protein and phospholipid in the membrane of the RBC that make it more rigid. So when it passes through the capillaries of the infected animal, it bursts, and that is how the hemolysis occurs. And of course, the by the uh, RBC also cause hemolysis, but it uh, it is also physiological also. So in both way, the hemolysis is there and. Uh, the hemoglobin goes down and the melondyl aldehyde level is also increased in this uh, infected animal. So the idea is to, these are the infected by electron microscopy, we match it. So how this, like, uh, they change in the shape and granular set and then change in the characteristic of the RBC also. that make it to the lysis. Okay, this is the infected animal picture. This, you can appreciate bilirubinemia and the, uh, in the infected animal, and this is see the house sphere is infection. We can see even the in the uh, monocytes or neutrophils. You can see the infect the parasite. You can see appreciate these are parasites. The how how heavy infection is there in the area in the field when it get clinically infected, and the symptoms are uh, high fever, and uh, this is, uh, and the animal will not respond to the normal antibiotic. And will only respond to the antistrip. And uh, then polyky pain is also observed in some of the animals. And the animal will be restless and off weight. And these are the few symptoms, but it can be confused with the other disease. But uh, some are very particular hemorrhages on the mucous membrane are very characteristic to the thaleriasis or the thaleria annulata infection in the animals. Yeah. 
and in the uh, abortion has also been observed and the disease is observed in the clinical cases subacute and chronic we are more worried about the chronic this is the latency and it is very much highly prevalent in, uh, in the coins of the region like rajasthan up over punjab haryana these are very much uh, over more than 50% of our equine population are chronically or latently infected and they are threat to the native animals so that is why if you see that uh, our industry is suffering from this uh, latency infection because our horses cannot be exported if a horse is infected is positive to the filaria equi it cannot go to the outside country it cannot be exported and uh, roughly it cannot participate even in the equestrian event in the asian games uh, some of the horse, our horses when it was uh, happening in the china <laughs> so some of the horses uh, were horses which were participating were in positive and of course uh, there were restriction on the uh, on the export of and of course they have to be participate in the equestrian separately in the separate group so this is how but this uh, the countries which are not having this they will not like to receive the infected horses so ticks are prevalent everywhere so uh, that is why there is strong restriction on the movement international movement of the horses which is positive for the player so now we are coming to the risk factor analysis uh, we did uh, risk factor analysis on the uh, on the samples uh, thousand of samples were collected from the different region of the country like rajasthan gujarat and haryana and then we plotted the you see the, how much in the, the infection rate is very high in this country and then we find that the mules are more prone to the infection as compared to the horses and cattle because mule is more <coughs> Uh, put on use uh, by the poor farmer uh, for uh, for uh, in cart and uh, other purpose that is why they are in more contact with the other animal and that is why they are more prone to the uh, horses and uh, to the you see how much this rpp is very high in this and this is the alaya rpp in rajasthan area is the most you can see the highly endemic bird in the country so we also uh, did uh, the risk analysis for the uh, other age group you know that the age and male get older uh, the age is not so much significant but the gender yeah female male are less male are less uh, infected with the as compared to the female because the male population population male is normally used for the breeding purpose so the population or number in a region is less as compared to the female and uh, female are more in contact with the other females uh, so they are more prone to the infection when, and the males are kept in isolation than the other females so they are less infected with the uh, filaria infection in equi as compared to the female okay and uh, the young ones are nave and there is no trans placental transmission of the parasite but the antibodies were transferred to the folds through colostrum that we made a study and that remains in the fold for a period of around 63 days the antibody level that uh, fold received from the mare through colostrum remains in the body for 63 days and until then the animal is uh, protected but after that it became more prone right? that the one to five months you can see that this relative this factor is increasing this is one point something one point something okay. and uh, another is the managemental practices uh, that are uh, done at a farm we have observed that the organized farm are less uh, are less uh, point as compared to the organized farm for so unorganized farm an organized farm has less infection but as compared to the unorganized as point 3 and when the animal species are kept with the other species and the presence of the ticks it potentiate the infection rate uh, for the contacting the animal with it two two times two times if ticks are present on the field and if animals are kept on the kacha and pakka and the kacha uh, horses are more prone to the infection because uh, kacha houses have 
more thick colonies, colonies, colonies in their premises. That is why the ticks are more harboring in the kacha house, I can the pakka house, you know it very well. And if the animal is, is uh, doing some anti-tick spray or other practices, it is using them, it is less prone. So these are the, some of the risk factors uh, that uh, can be kept in mind uh, and that uh, uh, help in maintaining the infection in the field. Uh, in the level, in the field level, and uh, these are the, some of the factors that are uh, available. That you can okay, now coming to the diagnostic, which is more important uh, for the control point of view, and uh, four uh, diagnostic are the microscopy, serum, and the molecule. Microscopy is the only blood stain, but it is very difficult to demonstrate the parasite in the carrier animal. Because the parasite will be, parastemia will be groundwork and say only 10,000 we can observe two parasites and that in a in a slide uh, in a blood smear in a in a field we usually observe 400 to 500 RBC and it is very difficult to demonstrate or to find a para infected in the carrier level. So in the field it is very troublesome. So serum, uh, there are many tests that OI has recommended. The competitive ELISA is the only uh, test that the OI is recommending for the transport of the animal and the indirect ELISA and the IFAT. IFAT and ELISA, if animal is positive in IFAT and ELISA, though it is confirmatory. It is confirmatory, the OI is accepting and the, all the countries are accepting. But IFAT is the final one because in IFAT we demonstrate the parasite, the presence of the parasite and the uh, it is a direct test, I, IFAT, and when the ELISA is the indirect test, and the molecule techniques, the PCR and QPCR amplification, of course, they are also detecting the presence of the parasite. So overlap has uh, almost uh, all the facilities for this type of test. I will show you the, some of the slides of ELISA. Actually, Mirojet has the two type of surface protein on its body. They are called EMA1 and EMA2. And uh, they share, they are not cross reactive to each other. I will not give, go in detail of these uh, research type of things. So, uh, these are the amino acids. You can see how much homology in the, they are sharing the homologous, but the antibodies are not cross reacting. So, the EMA1 and EMA2 antibodies are not cross reacting to each other. And uh, we just made a panel how much the EMA1 and EMA2 are. Uh, responsible in the different life cycle of the cellular FI in the animal body. You can see that uh, this is the antigenic shedding of the EMA2 in the infected RFC. This is the parasite, which is not observed in the EMA1. Antigenic shedding is not observed by the EMA1, and the EMA1 surface protein is not shedding. And uh, this expression of EMA1 and EMA2 surface protein is uh, is not is not present once they are egressing of the parasite when they are preparing to release to be released from the infected parasite. Of course, it is present when they are in the multiplying. So uh, we conceptualize that EMA2 is more important during the life cycle of the parasite. So we made EMA2 as a diagnostic uh, diagnostic uh, antigen uh, for the a diagnosis of the cellular FI, and we express uh, this is the same outside the RBC, uh, yeah. and we express this EMA2. This is the express. This is the recombinant protein. This is the native protein, and we express and purified this and use it in the ELISA, and it was working very well in ELISA. This and uh, this has again been validated on the with the Western blot. We can see the very strong signal with the Western blot also and in ELISA also. So it is uh, the results are matching very high. And with the competitive ELISA, we also validated the competitive ELISA is the, by the VMRD. So ELISA that we optimize for the based on EMA2 and its results are comparable with the Western blot and the competitive ELISA. And then we transform this uh, ELISA in the ELISA form of the a diagnostic. Form of a diagnostic. Hello. Yeah. Hello. And and then, then this kit was optimized in the laboratory. And laboratory and it was released in the 2015. I'm receiving the echo of my voice. It is. 
I'm audible to all. Dr. Nilesh, is okay? Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it, this kit was, and now our laboratory is using this kit for the zero prevalence, and uh, our laboratory has tested more than tested more than seven thousand. Seven thousand of samples and every year, and fifteen hundred of samples from the sample of the from the different regions. And we are preparing, we are preparing the different identified different joints, different joints which are highly endemic. These are important. These are important for circular And these are the map. We mapped it on the different region, and we can we we can see that. 35%, 50%, 33%, 50% Maharashtra. But uh, we have not received the sample from, but uh, largely equine population is also not there in this region. And in South also equine population is not much there. And these are the region which are having more of the equine population. And uh, most of the indigenous population is more infected as compared to the thoroughbred. I, I must say that our race horses are having the thoroughbred uh, animals. And they are not much infected because they never come in contact with the our indigenous population. Because our indigenous population is infected and thoroughbred are never coming in contact with the indigenous and they remain negative. Or for ticks are there in the thoroughbred, but largely they remain negative. And our indigenous population is more infected. Secondly, we IFAT, we also develop IFAT because as per the OI protocol. Uh, IFAT is required for the confirmation of the IFAT. So, because the, we prepared the slides from the mass culture that we are doing it, and you see the, how the slides look like. All these panels are positive panels in the IFAT, and these are the negative panels in the IFAT. So, this is confirmative because these uh, green dots are actually the parasite, and we are demonstrating the parasite as such in the in the blood smear. So that is more confirmatory than the ELISA. ELISA is the indirect test. Uh, we are indirectly saying the antibodies are present, but those antibodies are now uh, are now adsorbed on the surface of the mirozoite or parasite, and we are observing this situation. That is why IFAT is more confirmatory as compared to the uh, ELISA. Also, yeah, we have also developed the multiplex uh, PCR also for simultaneous infection of the Thleria equi and Babesia cabali. And uh, these are the 540 band is for Babesia cabali and 392 is for Thleria equi. So in one go, we can diagnose, uh, our, we have diagnosed 200 sample and 44 were positive for Thleria equi only. We cannot find even a single for cabali because it is not very much prevalent. Of course, we have done a lot of zero surveillance. But uh, we cannot find, of course, we find one Babesa uh, Kavali and that we put in the culture. We had a culture of that animal. But that is only one from the Gujarat region. And then we used to validate, uh, okay, uh, the, uh, with the, all the tests that are available with us, uh, MASP, uh, ELISA, and I will touch some of the tests. Yeah. So now, uh, the, another test that is coming up is the point of care test. We call it. Uh, immunochromatography test or lateral flow assay that we have uh, because a lot of farmers are demanding the test which they can use at the farm, which a farmer can use. So LFA is, uh, we have also observed the pregnancy strip for the woman. So on the same format, uh, we developed the, we conjugated the EMA2 with the gold nanoparticles and this is the test line and this is the control line. So in the control line, we will observe the band, but if in the test line we observed a band, so animal is positive, declared positive for this area. And it took only 10 to 15 minutes. It's very, of course, the sensitivity is the compromise as compared to the ELISA, but actually it is a, uh, zero per, it is a for zero progress purpose, it is very good test. You can find whether the, this belt is infected or not. This is the common format for developing the LFA for any type of disease. And uh, we used EMA2 antigen for developing this uh, LFA. And uh, we conjugated uh, okay, uh, with the uh, purified IgG. We have to purify the IgG because we have to put it on the control line. Okay, these are this type I will not touch. Uh, this is the conjugation. After conjugation, this OD, they received in the OD. 
of the antigen after conjugation. This is how we test the OD. And this is how we look like. The test line is there. You see the test line, and this is the control line. So if animal is positive, we will observe a band at the test line, and this is the negative animal. We will not observe any band on the negative. And uh, of course, we develop this uh, uh, LFA in the test line. Of, uh, you can appreciate this, this band. Faint band is there in the positive animal, and positive and negative animal is not showing any band. And uh, we develop, and then we again validated with the PCR and uh, with some uh, ELISA, we validated the results that we observed on the LFA with the other test. And almost our results are comparable, and the very high. Uh, diagnostic sensitivity and specificity is very high. 0.94 and 97 is as compared to the ELISA is very high diagnostic sensitivity. And we have tested a lot. Uh, now we are using it in routine in our lab also. And this uh, was prepared in the form of a kit. And this kit was also released uh, on the ICR Foundation, I think in 18, 2018, this kit was released. And uh, okay. Now coming to the mass culture, this is another in vitro diagnostic test. Uh, only few laboratories in the world are having the mass culture because it is very difficult to establish mass culture for this parasite. And we have established this mass culture and in routine. We are using it for the diagnostic purpose and for the treatment purpose also in our laboratory. And uh, you can see that when they put the sample on fifth day, the parastemia start coming around. And when we, it, it can go until nine or 10% parastemia we can observe in the mass culture. And then we have to subculture it. And then again, uh, this cycle goes on. This subculture and culture. And this is how the mass culture uh, goes. And this is the, we have observed the osmotic fragility of this clearacquai in the mass culture. As the parastemia increased in the RBC, it is become more fragile, more osmotic fragile. as uh, we have, as I have explained before also in the infected animal, there is increase in the phospholipid concentration of the RBC and we become more fragile. That's why we are explaining the same thing here. It has become more fragile after uh, the parastemia increases there. In the less parastemia, it is not so much fragile. And uh, of course, uh, yeah, this was another aim. Uh, if the animal is antibody positive, whether it is uh, having the parasite or not. So we have demonstrated the live parasite in the antibody positive animal. So it, it, uh, it has built up a trust in the ELISA test. The positivity that we are getting in the ELISA uh, sometimes confuse the researcher or the field, uh, and field uh, or the owner also, because we are demonstrating the antibodies and he can say whether the parasite is present or not in the antibody positive animal. So we put, we collected the sample from the four antibodies and for the RBC for the mass culture. So simultaneously we, we uh, detected, we tested the sample in ELISA and put it in the mass culture. So we can demonstrate the parasite, live parasite in the antibody positive. So invariably in uh, most of the samples we can demonstrate the parasite. And of course, uh, we also did uh, the qPCR. We used this qPCR to uh, to identify the parasitic load in the uh, infected animal. Because the animal is infected, but we don't know how much parasitic load is there. So if there is low, uh, very high parasitic loads, uh, its performance will be compromised, and the animal will be more prone to the clinical infection to convert the uh, this chronic infection to the clinical infection is, is, is more prone. And we optimize this uh, real-time PCR and the clone, and then we can say that it has very high parasitic load. If OD is high, then it has very high parasitic load that we have demonstrated with the PCR. And then we, uh, okay, the results were again validated with the PCR and the ELISA. Yeah. Uh, so after uh, after having all this facility, so we also had a, a project uh, with the OI sponsored project to any project with the Japanese laboratory, which, which is OI uh, OI reference laboratory. So uh, we then uh, we then uh, uh, ISO NABL uh, one seven zero two five 
we got the ISO 1025 accredited lab for equine paraplasmosis by NABL in last year 2019. And uh, now we will prepare our application for the OI. We will submit to the OI for recognizing our laboratory as a reference laboratory. That is the activity will, that will be there this year. So this year we will submit the application to recognize our laboratory as a reference laboratory. In India, I think uh, two or three laboratories are there for in veterinary field. For uh, like uh, this, uh, which are recognized by the OI. Recently, the rabies lab was recognized by the OI as a in India, and another lab is for the, in this Kerala that is for the vital disease for the fish. That there are not so much OI, OI referral laboratories in our country. This is the OI tuning laboratory project that we finished in 13, and then we applied. Uh, to the referral status and then we got the NABL. So this is the requirement. Okay, now moving to the control of the animal, and uh, uh, we have identified few molecules that we can use as a host parasite interacting molecules that can be exploited for the for the making vaccine and uh, for uh, interpreting. So in this field, uh, in this area, because when the parasite attached on the surface of the RBC, you can see these are the uh, yeah, apical, apical organs. They help in penetration of the RBC, uh, of the myrozoite to the RBC membrane. These are the junction and that invasion process is mostly by the apical, by the rope tree and the macronym product and then where it gets internalized in the RBC. And at that time, what are the molecules uh, that are the host parasite interacting, that are interacting from the a parasite protein and the host protein. So what molecules help the parasite to get internalized? So that was our aim to identify those uh, those protein in the host which are helping the parasite to get internalized. And then we planned our experiment. And uh, our uh, sir, our aim was: uh, Is there EMA2 has any effect to, towards the host specific protein? Because EMA2 is more important for the for the pyrazoids. So this is the main target, our aim. So what are the protein in the host specific membrane that EMA2 is interacting with? And then, okay, okay. And then we identified that uh, we did solubilization of the uh, RBC membrane and then uh, other things were done. And these are the RBC membrane. And then we find that the uh, there is one protein that is present in the actin. This is the actin molecule in the erythrocytic membrane that is interacting with the EMA2 surface, surface protein of the myrosite, which is absent in the EMA1 is not 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 uh, interacting with the EMA1. So we can see this is only present in the EMA2 panel. This is protein protein interaction. Uh, the protein protein were interacted. So we we pinpointed that the Actin molecule in the RBC membrane is the basic. This is the actin molecule, and uh, we, we demonstrate that actin molecule in the uh, GST pull down assay is there. Actin protein in the erythritic membrane of the host of the RBC is interacting with the. And if we see the role of this actin molecule, this is the actin molecule. This is the structure of the skeleton of the erythritic membrane of any erythritic membrane, and uh, this is the membrane surface and. It's mainly role of this actin protein is the movement, movement, and the parasite requires its movement when it's getting internalized. So it basically attaches itself to the actin molecule of the parasite. So EMA2 is interacting with the EMA. But these experiments are very difficult to plan and very difficult to demonstrate also. So these are the protein, and this actin has also role in the plasmodium also. Parasite is also they have been demonstrated. So our experiment that actin molecule in the host is interacting with the parasites. Of course, uh, yeah, we also planned how much chromosome it has. So yeah, so, so this parasite is having four chromosomes. These are the four chromosomes, and uh, this EMA1 and EMA2 are present on different chromosomes. Of course, they are very much related. They are surface protein, but they are not present on the same chromosome. So EMA1 is present on chromosome number three. But EMA2 is present on chromosome number one. Chromosome number one is the largest size. The total size is 11.9 megabase pair of this parasite. 
So this is a very complex mechanism to explain and to, uh, to explain the role of the EMA1 and EMA2, why they are on different chromosome and what would be probably role. Uh, this is an expert that we would like to explore much and what are the roles of the surface protein in the life cycle of the parasite. So yeah, this is the comparative genomic license from a research paper. So this is the Theria koi. You see that Theria koi is different from the other Theria parasite of the animals. You see its genomic size is more as compared to Theria parva and Theria annulata and Babesia bijana. This is plasmodium. And its nuclear coding is also different and the mitochondrial genome size is also large. And the coded protein are also more as compared to the other tools here. So that is why it is more unique and uh, uh, than the another website. And it, it has we can find more analysis or comparative genomics can give more insight, and we can identify more target protein for the drug or for some vaccine candidate on this area. It's quite. So this is also very diverse genomic diversity. We are aiming uh, if EMA1 and EMA2 we are having in Gujarat, Rajasthan samples are collected and how much it is near to the another wild type EMA that are reported in the literature. So we can say that we have all the uh, all the different strains we can say that uh, and some strains are different also from these are the uh, Florida strain of the wild type that is uh, uh, used by many workers from the, for many purposes. So our Florida strain is very near, but it is also very far away. Also. So we have our unique strain. And uh, same with the EMA1 also. These are the unique strain, uh, uh, wild type strain, but our it is different, it, it distancing from the wild type. So we are having a unique EMA uh, clearly quite in our region, in our different region, which are highly endemic. Okay. So currently, there are only two drugs that are available: uh, imidacloprid dipropionate and dimenagine acetate. Of course, the imidacloprid is the drug of choice for this clearly quite uh, as compared to the parenil. And these drugs were developed in 60s. So. Now the farmers or the veterinarian are finding difficult to cure the. Uh, of course, re recently bupropion was also defined for the cure of this. Clearly, I know later bupropion is a drug of choice. So some worker have reported bupropion as a drug of choice for clearly equi also, but uh, they are highly toxic drug, as I have mentioned here. They have limited safety margin, very limited safety margins there because their IC50 is very near to the LD50. That is why they are, are very near to the safety margin and they are very highly pathogenic and liver toxic drugs and we cannot repeat it. And none of the drug is uh, able to control the latency in the animal. So, and the for imidocarb, we give around four milligram per kg body weight, and three sorts are given, 72 hours apart, and same with the perineal. Uh, but none of the drugs is, is, can cure the parasite. And these are the drugs which are given in the clinical stage of the animal. Okay. So, because our lab has also uh, established the this uh, in vitro culture, so we are more wish to or identify some drug targets so there is no vaccine or so that uh, we can address those drug targets. So these are the drug targets, uh, uh, IP complexion and various drug targets has been defined uh, for the plasma. Yeah. 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 Cytosol, digestive chemicals, membrane, mitochondrial nucleus. So, and uh, we also tried, uh, okay, these are the drugs which are available in the second son. And uh, if you surprise, the fujisic acid and the heparin, heparin, heparin is uh, very much toxic to the drug parasite. So, for, uh, for the, if the parasite has to be put on the in vitro culture, we should not collect the blood in the heparin. We need the blood to be collected in the EDTA, not in the heparin. And the Fujisic, and uh, these are the drugs. Uh, so sometimes we redefine the drug also, repurposing of the drug. So we took some target 
Pixoc proteins and the phospholipid metabolism membrane. These drug targets which tested these drug molecules, some harmelin and the harmelin are the specific that, that we tested in our uh, in our uh, in vitro culture. These are different drugs that we have tested, and these are the IC50 of the drug. You see that uh, SD tab is having very less IC50, and it is uh, also not so much toxic to the uh, horse membrane. Of course, the list is very long, but I cannot put it. Uh, and no biosin are yeah, no biosin is also is the antibiotic. Uh, this is also a drug of choice, and then it is also giving some antithelial activity in the in vitro culture, but to be tested and in vivo. And these are the, some of the graphs. Uh, for you can see that different graphs are there, and different drug molecules and different morphology are there, and cytotoxicity is there. Because these are the different uh, lumefentrin that the paper that we recently published in tick and tick bone diseases is the new drug lumefentrin we define uh, that is a uh, SSP negative and that is also responsible for uh, for arresting the growth of the parasite in the so in future now we are uh, some plant extract now we are because we have to identify some drug, novel drug molecule. So some, now we are uh, testing some plant molecules, testing some plant molecules. We have done some studies also. And uh, we have identified some bleed molecules. And so that work is underway in this area. But this is a very long task. Uh, this is a multidisciplinary approach by different working group. Uh, we have to work together to identify or to develop a new drug molecule. So our lab is now working in this area, in developing some new drug molecules for the parasite, identifying some new parasite from the drug. So yeah, this is some selected publication of my group. Yeah, I thank you, all my students and the research facility and my collaborator, NRCP Japan, the funding agency, IVRI, the, I get most of the students from the IVRI and the was also. So I thank you. Uh, acknowledge the contribution of my students and everybody. Yeah, this is all. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much sir, for your stimulating and enthusiastic speech, sir. Yeah. Sir, you all recognize the tremendous effort and energy you put into this presentation. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Man. I can definitely provide much needed help to the body parasitologists and the field veterans. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, sir, there are a few questions from the participants, yeah. sir. Please, please, please. So the first question is, uh, since you have told, sir, MR2 is yeah. a diagnostic candidate, sir. Yeah, yeah. Is, is it has any vaccine potential? Uh, yes, most of the surface protein have the vaccine potential also, but uh, we have not tested it in vivo. Of course, it can give some vaccine potential that have to be tested because that is why we are talking about, about Japanese collaborative. We are talking about if it has a vaccine potential. The problem is that in this... Uh, Protogen parasite, we, we don't have any in vitro uh, in vivo model, laboratory in vivo model. That is the problem in testing the labor, uh, the vaccine potential. Uh, we have to go to the natural host for that. So of course, it may have some vaccine potential that we have to be tested. That we can establish okay. by in vitro, by some experiment that we are thinking of also. Yeah. Okay, sir. The next question is whether latent cases of telere equi mm -hmm. should be treated or not. Should you go for treatment for telere equi? Uh, yeah, I, I don't suggest that you could uh, that one should go if the animal is latently infected uh, because the treatment will not do anything. It will not favor anything. It will but uh, but uh, because these drugs are toxic, uh, it will liver toxic drugs. So I don't think that you should go for the treatment. The treatment will not clear the parasite. Will not clean the parasite. Will not clean the animal also. So only go for treatment when there is clinical case. When you can see the parasite in the blood smear and animal is clinically infected. Otherwise, no treatment is not required. Okay, sir. Sir, is there any report of Hilary equi in Jebra mm -hmm. in India or elsewhere? In in Jebra. Uh, yes, yes. We got recently uh, uh, recently we received from some Jebra from the South Africa. And uh, uh, we uh, we identified or uh, we isolated also the three acquired from the Jebra, and that was highly pathogenic. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. 
sir do thelere equi also multiply hmm. in the rbc yeah thelere equi multiply in the rbc yeah thelere equi multiply le sir yeah it's no reject sir. multiply in the rbc okay okay sir what should be the line of treatment for thelere equi the line i uh, there are two drugs imidocarb imidol and the baronil the imidol is now available in the country if the animal is clinically infected so give a one shot of the uh, baronil or uh, imidocarb 4 mg per kg body weight and then repeat it after 72 hours three times that we have to do it for three times at 72 hours the same dose rate so then uh, the most of the people they don't repeat the drug <clears throat> Okay, so it is in the proof. So two hours is important, but simultaneously we must give some uh, uh, liver enzyme because the, it is a liver toxic drug. So we have to safeguard liver also. So that uh, supportive therapy is more important than the curative therapy. So that we have to take care. Of. That clinician have to take care. Of. The next question is from Dr. B N Mandi sir. Yeah. Immunity. Primitive is there. Yeah, most of the yeah, primitive is uh, already uh, always there in the, most of the uh, protozoans. You know that primitive is the uh, it is auto uh, that is the immunity. Dual, of course, primitive is there because by, once the animal is infected, it, it become lifelong positive. So the parasite trigger the immune system and that animal will become pre-immune. But that pre-immune break whenever there is other stress are there. Yeah, primitive is there. Okay. Sir, the last question is, sir, already have discussed about the LIC kit and the LIC kit, sir. Sir, yeah. whether uh, these are already available for other uh, state university or uh, other institutes? Yeah, we can, of, we can, we can give the LIC uh, to the university because uh, we want to commercialize it. But no, not so much companies are coming up because in India, the wine industry is not so much big. Only 11 lakh crores are there. So the commercial companies are not coming up, and they want the international like that. So of course, some universities we can provide the kit, no problem. Yeah. Sir, the question, last question is, sir, is Thelere Equi is more mm -hmm. in small kits or not? Like, sir, mule, donkey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the donkeys are not so uh, are resistant. We can say donkey and mule are resistant, but the horses are very much sensitive to the Thelere Equi. Uh, but the prevalence rate is the same, or we can find more in donkeys and mules in the same. It is, yeah. Same. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Now we request uh, Dr. Snehil to propose vote of thanks. Very good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Dr. Snehil Gupta, would like to take the opportunity. To deliver formal word of thanks to Dr. Sanjay Kumar. Once a great man said, feeling gratitude and not expressing it is like a wrapping up and not giving it. Today, I would like to take the opportunity to put all my gratitudes in the form of words. Your sir, your vast experience gives us a lot of inspiration that when researchers should be well focused and strive hard toward his goal to ultimately reach some output. Sir, we extend our sincere appreciation. For your outstanding presentation, your lecture was exactly what we need to hear. On my own behalf, my behalf, on behalf of my participant and the organizing committee, I would like to thank Dr. Sanjay Kumar for sharing his vast experience on equine pyroplasmosis. I personally believe such delegation would be a source of inspiration for budding parasitologists so they can opt such kind of research problem in the near context. Once again, thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Dr. Sahil. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank for giving an opportunity on this platform to be a part of this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Now I request Dr. Bora to please conclude the second day of the webinar. Please, Bora. Sir. Good afternoon to all of you. On the behalf of organizing committee, I thank. I thanks Dr. M. C. Agarwal for his video message. I also thank Dr. Sri Kumar and Dr. Sanjay Kumar for their expert lecture. lecture was, lectures were very informative, very interactive also, and there was many queries. Though due to time constraints, we were not able to answer all of them, but remaining will be giving by the text message with answer. And above all, I should thank all the participants of the national webinar series for. 
WhatsApp. Tomorrow we'll again meet at 9:30. Thank you. Thank you, sir.